creating cosmos out of chaos. You know, you look at the Beatles, right? You look at, you study a little bit of Beatles music. Yeah. It's almost like they start right on the chorus. Mm -hmm. She loves you, yeah, yeah. Like, it's beautiful like that. They don't right? always build up. I mean, a lot of their music would just bam right into it's it. it. What, right what's now. funny later in, um, in my life earlier, actually, I did a lot with songs. And the argument with the artist was always, from a record label perspective, get to the chorus and the hook within like 11 seconds. Quick. And it's funny to hear you say the Beatles, because it's like, you're right, yeah. they, didn't even, they didn't waste that 11 Not seconds. Not much. They went right to it. That's really so, cool, actually. And it's funny, because you think about that with film. Like, um, I'm a big uh, Orson Welles fan. And when I was doing Earthlings, uh, I don't know why this happened, but I was researching Earthlings. It took many years to put it all together. And... Um, I saw somehow an interview with Orson Welles, who's long been passed away, long yeah. dead. And, and it was the interview was in Las Vegas. He had a home there. And it was about a year before he died, this interview. And, he, and I just caught this interview. And I was working on Earthlings, and I'm looking at all this heavy footage all day and researching all these heavy issues. And somehow I see this interview with this f great film director from the past. Mm -hmm. And they asked him about Citizen Kane which was his first film. He was 24 years old when he made this movie. Wow. And, um, and he had at the time what was considered the most coveted four-way contract in the history of Hollywood. What's a four-way contract? Well, that's writer, director, producer, actor, which means he can't be fired, you know, in many ways. Like, yeah. really, and, and people don't realize that Citizen Kane is a heavy special effects film. There's a lot of special effects in, in a movie like that at, at its time. Anyway, so the interviewer says... Um, you started at the top with Citizen Kane, and Kane, uh, and sorry, Wells is, he's in his 70s, he's very obese, he's very large, and he's a very jovial character, he's like Falstaff from Shakespeare, and he says, um, he says, I started at the top and I've been working my way down, and he has this huge laugh, <laughs> and I'm watching this, and something about that laugh and that statement belies what he's really saying, like, and I began, while I was working on this heavy, dark documentary, I began just as a break from it. it had nothing to do with the animals, nothing to do with the environment, nothing to do with humanity. Researching a little bit about this filmmaker, mm -hmm. Orson Welles. And um, I read 40 books. I ended up reading all these books on him and I wrote wow. a movie about him. Because I, I could not get him out of my head. And it was tragic because he started at 24. He writes and directs Citizen Kane. And for the next 50 years, he never gets that kind of contract again. He never huh. gets the freedom he had before. And in, in his life, I think he made 12 movies at a time when guys like Hitchcock, John Ford, uh, Truffaut were cranking out two or three pictures a year. Yeah, yeah. At the end of their lives, they'd made 60, 70 movies and Orson had made 12. Hmm. And of those 12, seven were taken from him and re-edited. So there's really only five true, pure Orson Welles films in the canon of films. And this is from the guy who started with Citizen Kane. And um, so I, I just thought a lot about cinema and the power of movies while I was making a documentary about, mm -hmm. a, you know, an issue that people aren't super keen on, that's uncomfortable. And um, somehow those two, something about Wells's life helped with the structure of Earthlings in some way that you probably can't pinpoint, huh. but something about just addressing something. And so I, I don't special thanks or anything to him and the thing but he had this influence i mentioned it because we're talking about the beatles and we're talking about great artists and, yeah, yeah yeah and the influence they can have on wow. on future generations wow and what inspired you to, to start making and creating earthlings i saw footage you saw so footage. i saw footage and wow. and i you know i'm a filmmaker and i i suppose if i was a writer i'd probably would have written a book mm -hmm. and if i was a musician maybe i'd sing about it and if i was smart enough and i could start an organization maybe i'd do a nonprofit or something that wasn't my interest but i saw footage and because i do footage i just decided were you vegan when you saw the footage? no i was vegetarian okay so uh i was married and my first my wife uh only married once uh at the time was she was from india and she was vegetarian so when i started dating her in my 20s i just said oh i, I guess i'm vegetarian <laughs> that's, that's the drill and but man she she created a whirlwind she had no idea what was going to happen because i kept going deeper down oh, wow. that path and i was like wait what like wait do you you know because i never knew i was i grew up with the standard western diet like most people you know where'd you grow up here in la i was born here in la yeah i was born on sunset boulevard actually and so i just grew up in la and 
just a standard diet like pretty much everybody else. Yeah, of course. So you find these things out and you're just kind of shocked, you know? Mm -hmm. What's interesting about animal cruelty is um, um, it's like we don't like torture, right? I mean, humans, even our enemies, like we, it's just like no bueno, right? When we look mm -hmm. at, uh, you know, like Abu Ghraib and all this, you know, when we look at torture, like it's not cool. Mm -hmm. The way we treat animals is the only time where it's like totally fine. Yeah. Like do what you want. Doesn't matter if you're religious, doesn't matter if you're ethical, doesn't matter what your political preference is. It seems it is, it is so ingrained that um, um, we somehow just are cool with, and most people, if you ask them, they kind of know what's going on. Right. Yeah, and in this day of YouTube, you can see anything now, but back at the time when we did Earthlings, you know, you had to, it was films and things right, or yeah. books and stuff. It's websites, but I find that interesting, that sort of, uh, blind spot. Well, the disconnect, well, right? Yeah. yeah. The disconnection, I think, for a lot of people. And that's the thing is when those movies come out, and especially, you know, when Earthlings came out, like what year exactly was it released? Finished it in 04, and we released it in 05. So that was like early still early yeah. i find in the world of veganism as well like veganism wasn't even as you know mainstream as yeah. it is now and so for people to open their eyes and to see mm. what was really going on and to start to make that connection to where their food actually comes from that's mm. like you're saying that's very uncomfortable yeah. for a lot of people at that and, point you must have received a lot of um a lot of energy <laughs> you know what's interesting is that <laughs> once it was finished i was trying to get it distributed right uh -huh. And I had a pretty big star in it, you know, Joaquin yeah. right. with his voice as a narrator, I should say. And um, we, it came out in 05, right at the same time they released a movie he did called Walk the Line, where he played Johnny Cash. Yeah. So we brought it, we brought it out right, right with that. And we got interest because, because Joaquin was really right. buzzing from this. And sure enough, people were like, oh, what, it, okay, hold on. He did this other movie. What is this? What's this filming narrated? And I remember I got a call from uh, HBO and the head of West the head of West Coast Acquisitions called and said, um, "We, we want to look at your film." So I, I sent him the film, and then it was interesting because he he said, "Let's have lunch. I've seen your movie. Let's have lunch." Mm -hmm. And I met him for lunch in Santa Monica, and um, he was a large man. He was a very large man, and he ordered he ordered uh, he ordered steak and eggs or something. It was kind of a brunch thing, and steak and. Yeah, he ate, you know, he ate, he didn't, mm -hmm. he didn't modify his diet for our, his meeting with me for, <laughs> okay. for what it was worth. Not that he really had to per right. se, but he didn't seem to care. And, and he said, uh, right at the beginning, as soon as he ordered and the food came, he says, I'm not, we're not going to pick up your movie. And I remember thinking, uh, I wonder why he called for a personal sit down yes. to say no, wow. unless he just wanted to say no to my face or something. I wasn't sure. I couldn't, I, it was really odd. I was like, I didn't quite know how to, I was like, okay. I was like, wow, bought me lunch, I guess. That's cool. I said, why not? And he goes, um, it's a propaganda film. It's a propaganda film. Wow. And I, said, why do you, what, what, I said, why do you call it that? And he goes, well, you offer no opposing viewpoints. Um, so that's propaganda. And I said, hang on a second. Uh, the news should, should be straight down the line, you know, yeah. or offer opposing viewpoints and let the viewer decide. I said, but I'm a filmmaker and frankly... A film should be infused with a point of view. It should take a stand. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, you're getting bombarded daily by the other stuff. In your billboards, and your radio, and your TV, and your ads, and your magazines. It's pretty much a constant yeah. sales yeah. pitch. So the fact that there might be this little documentary out there that says something else, and you're not going to pick it up, calling it propaganda, I said, ah, I, I have to disagree with you. I said, and don't shoot the messenger, man, just because if you don't like what you're seeing, it, it's not my fault. You know, this is just... How we treat pets, food, clothing, entertainment, medical research. This is this is a movie about all the ways man uses animals for economic purposes. Right. So if you're uncomfortable with it, I mean, I didn't start it. It goes back way before me. I said, show it. Show it. Yeah. Let them scoff as they please, you know. I mean, like, ah, we can't do it. So that was my first education. You talk about being uncomfortable or people or right. energy, you said. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. I remember that meeting. And so how did you end up? releasing it we gave it away for free on the internet right um we submitted a 25 film festivals that was 04 05 so that was pre a lot of the web stuff the web stuff was out of course but yeah no we, no. Were, we were submitting vhs copies yeah. with a letter and a packet it's interesting back then it's not that long ago really but the but technology a lot has changed, changed. Yeah, but, yeah 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 
Like and um, I got 25 rejection letters. From the festivals? From festivals, yeah. They used to send back a letter and say, thanks, we're passing. Um, even with Joaquin. Even with Joaquin. So I remember thinking, okay, I get it. This is, mm -hmm. this is not you know, a comfortable piece, I said. But the, what threw me was documentary festivals passing on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, do, there's pure documentary mm -hmm. festivals. Of course. And I remember I got a hold of somebody. I can't remember where it was. It might have been in New Orleans. Like I'm trying to remember where this festival was. And because I usually don't tell you why, you can't. They just they pass. Okay. And I got a hold of somebody, and I said, "Why? Why?" And this woman was very nice. She said, "Listen, we watched your movie, and this is an important piece. This should be seen." She goes, "But we have like vendors that come to this fe this festival, and and she <laughs> says, "I'm just being honest with you. We can't show your movie because it is in it is in opposition to the vendors that actually support this." So there was a business side. Yeah, at, a at least she was honest with no, me. No, it's true, but like. Even at a documentary festival, like that's the place you think the most integrity in, in cinema would yeah. lie. And I remember saying to him, I go, listen, I think it's totally cool. It's not a festival movie. It's really something you maybe sit down at home and yeah. kick in when you're ready to confront it. I said, but you can have docs about the Rolling Stones, touring with the Stones, transgender, maybe something about dinosaurs or paleo. Like you tackle whatever issue you mm -hmm. want, but tell me that somewhere in your catalog this year, you got something about animals, the yeah. environment, and humanity. And they do the humanity and in the environment, but the animal stuff is how, how so did, deep, 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 you know, deeply ingrained in people that it's hard. Did you find that frustrating? Sure, but even, when I, even when I took myself out of it, because I spent all my own money on it, and in the end, I had some people come on board. I'd actually finished it. And mm. I was so broke, because I'd spent, you know, I just put a bunch of money on credit cards over yeah. years to do it. So I had a couple people come on board in the end to really help me get it out and kind of, but the film was locked and done and edited and finished. Um, and I remember I, I, so I'd gotten divorced and I just had my little daughter and she's in the movie. There's a little scene of her. She's in both films, Unity 2. But, um, and I remember living in this little apartment and I was <laughs> so broken. I was like, man, like I, I knew it was going to be a tough sub. I didn't think I would like get any distribution, like they'd be ignored. And I remember I took myself out of it and I thought, you know what, if one person sees this movie, yeah. it'll have been worth it. One person. Mm -hmm. And um, it was probably within a year. We didn't have, we started making DVDs and I literally went to a place in Glendale here in LA County and they'd make 100 or 200 DVDs at a time. They'd press them. Yeah. You gave them the artwork, they gave them the, the film, mm -hmm. they'd press it. And I couldn't afford languages because at the time it was about 2000 bucks a language. Oh my God. To put a language on there, and we wanted to do Spanish, and you know, just yeah. a, a, some of the more prominent languages on the planet. I couldn't afford it, and people started emailing saying, "You got to have this in Spanish. You got to have this in other language." And I just, I just didn't have any more money, frankly. I was yeah. done, and and I remember getting an email from somebody in Brazil. Mm -hmm. It came. It started in Brazil. I have to give props to the activists and the passion of the activists in Brazil, at least as far as my experience that mm -hmm. I'm going to share with you. And they, um, they said, enclosed in this email is a file with the Portuguese translation oh, wow. of Earthlings. And what they did was, they, which means they watched the movie, they're pausing it every other sentence, yeah. it. writing it down, because we had to have a check in case they were just saying nonsense. <laughs> so I had to go find someone who still spoke Portuguese. <laughs> say, what is this guy saying that Joaquin is saying, that the movie's saying? But it was spot on. They did it. And they even... In the translation, they even modified it so that if it took longer to say something in Portuguese that mm -hmm. is said in English, they, you know, it was a translation. They translated it. Yeah, yeah. And I got one right after that in Russian. I got one in France. People so sending them to People yeah. did it themselves and started submitting it. Is that beautiful? And I was so touched. And we had it in 12. Uh, by, last I looked, it was over 45 languages we had it in now, of which we only did half a dozen. Wow. And and so people started sending us files. So every new batch of discs I'd make at the time we were into DVDs now would have four new languages or six yeah. new languages encoded huh. before it went online. But no, I, I I never made a penny off of that movie and we just I paid for it, we just gave it away. Uh to this day, if I had a dollar for every download of Earthlings, I would have been able to finance more of my movies, right. probably. Mm -hmm. But at the time when you finish it, you know. You didn't know. Moby was great too. We we I had original my original score for it was classical. Mm -hmm. I picked classical erroneously because I thought it would be cheaper. I yeah. thought classical music would be cheaper than some other kind of 
orchestral and i also thought it might be uh gentler on the viewer who's watching all this right. i call it traumatic knowledge right yes. so like you're getting bombarded and uh, i said let's do a classical score and uh, a, a good friend of mine libra max who became our music supervisor she said she she watched this cut mm -hmm. of the film with the classical score and she said she saw a moby and I know knew Moby's music. Yeah. In fact, the funny thing about Moby is his very first album, which is called Everything Is Wrong, which is from the '90s, which I bought at a CD store in San Diego. <laughs> and you open it up, and in there's all these liner notes. And if you get Moby's very first album, Everything Is Wrong, the liner notes are very small, and it's all about facts and figures about how we treat animals, the environment, deforestation. So here's a, mu a musical artist who, on his debut album. Is also messaging. Yeah. If you bother to read the yeah, lyrics, sure. but I thought his music was so electronic heavy. I thought, how is it? How am I going to show like slaughter footage with like this electronica? But Libra was like, you should try it. And I said, well, listen, I don't know if uh, usually when you're getting music clearance, you got to get the artist, you got to get the record label, and you got to get the publisher. It's like three, three things. Filmmakers should know that. By the way, if you're like. Get a U2 song. I swear if Bono came up to me and said, you can have anything you want, I'd be like, who's your publisher? Because <laughs> you got you got to get permission for from multiple sure. sources. Yeah. But Moby was great. He said, yes, record label was cool. Publisher was Warner and they were a little hesitant because we had 16 Moby songs, but they gave it to us. That's a lot of Moby songs. A lot of music. Publisher. So the majority of the yeah. music became, That's so powerful. became his stuff. So a lot of people contributed yeah. to, to, to the thing, but it was a slow rise. It mm -hmm. took years to catch on. Well, that's it. Oh, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, there's something really potent that you just said, traumatic knowledge. Yeah. And that's such a powerful word because, yeah. you know, being a vegan for 10 years, both of us, we've seen a lot sure. of footage to a point where at times you're just like, I, I know, mm -hmm. I know what's going on. Mm -hmm. I've seen it. Do I need to continue to expose myself mm -hmm. to this trauma and to the horrors that are happening? I'm already living as best as I can yeah. to not contribute to all of this darkness but can you speak to the idea of like is it important like for anyone watching and listening to this as well that might be feeling in the same boat like how do you deal with that as a vegan do you continue to also expose yourself to this yeah i do but you do it's a good question um like i just got an email from somebody about a facility it's actually here and it's how they gas it's pigs they gas the pigs so what they do is um you may have seen it before some of the stuff is not uncommon in yeah. modern facilities. Yeah. yeah, They move them into sort of an elevator that goes down and they suck out, it's not that they suck out the air, but they gas them with this stuff. It's pretty fast. I would say, I don't know, I haven't timed it. I would say 60 seconds or less, which is usually a USDA requirement, 60 seconds or less. We have funny laws in this country, in America, for those of your American listeners anyway, about animal husbandry and animal protection. Yeah. Something called the, uh, uh, let me make sure I get my my laws right. I think it's a 40 hour law, which means they can't be in a transport vehicle longer than 40 hours, but you can it can kind of be extended Yeah. without food or water. Um, there's other animal protection laws, but it doesn't apply to farm animals, which are the most heavily used. Just and ironically, the only one that really applies is a certain law that is only uh, enforced at the time of death. So they pretty much have no rights food animals, animals raised for food throughout their whole life up to except the moment of death. When you kill them, they have to be killed a specific way. What's that all about? And it's a 60 seconds or less. They have to die within 60 seconds. So we've been in slaughterhouses before and they kill the, they kill the animal and you'll see them go up and touch the eye to see because even a, even a body that's going through the trauma of death or the throes of death, throes is a good word too because it's uh, almost like in childbirth, the throes of childbirth, you know, so the agony of death they'll touch the eye because they're blinking there's still consciousness there so the animal must expire within 60 seconds um still if you've ever even been on a peloton bike or something and you got 45 seconds to go and you're dying what's that it's like einstein it's right? relative right it's very relative touch a hot pan forever 60 yeah. seconds on a hot pan 60 seconds having ex ex ecstatic it, passionate love exactly feel like an eternity yeah so it's like right that's fucking crazy to think about so that. But in oh. terms of traumatic knowledge, to answer your question, I mean, you know, people come by it honestly. I did. You probably did before you saw it. It's how we're raised. It's how we're brought up. It's in our culture. It's in our religion. It's in our nationality. People used to say to me, 
because there's things went around the world people would say oh dude i can't I, I can't go vegan man i'm i'm you know i'm portuguese like i'm from brazil we eat meat and i was like oh okay and then i meet a guy who's italian dude we can't i can't go vegan man i'm italian and guy, i'm russian you know i can't i'm from the south and i started going i don't think this is really about where anybody's from yeah mm -hmm. i think this is a human thing right mm -hmm. this is how we produce our food and the majority of people eat since we started animal agriculture um so i'm not trying to take away from anybody's identity yeah but i'll be honest with you it's not just you. Everybody uses that excuse. Mm -hmm. So, and me too at first. It's like, well, isn't this? But I always say every car is a blind spot, right? You could drive, drive a piece of crap or you could have like a, I don't know, pick your most expensive car, Lamborghini, man. If you don't mm -hmm. look over your shoulder, you're gonna miss something. So there's always a blind spot. Um, and um, do you wanna stick your head in the sand and hope this thing goes away? Or, you know, do you wanna be awake? I always say there's like, sleepwalking people there's like eyes fluttering people and then there's like awake people yeah. and we all kind of pass through all three stages mm -hmm. hopefully yeah hopefully in life and even when awake like there's always something that we can bring yeah. more consciousness towards yeah i think that's what's like it's really important on my path of how veganism has helped me shape my own identity mm -hmm. and consciousness is knowing that it's a journey mm -hmm. in the way I relate to it mm -hmm. and in the way that it brings more self-awareness to the different aspects of how I relate to the world, to other people and to myself. Mm -hmm. And I think like knowing we're all imperfect, all of us, like there's a thing about veganism. I think a lot of people think it's like the righteous vegan, you know, so people are just like, they're like vegans. Oh my God. Cause there's a lot of angry, righteous vegans. Yeah. And I understand that. Cause when I first, decided to make these decisions i was had so much anger and rage and yeah. and frustration with the way that the world worked yeah um and so i get that but there's Ooh, oh my goodness all right falling out of the tree Our little earthling here he's <laughs> dropping right? some beautiful stuff yeah. Heads but up. i just think that it's like to understand like i mean i'm far from a perfect vegan and yeah. i know that and it's yeah. all about the journey walking towards a a higher level of consciousness yeah. every day trying to be better than the day before not in just what i do and what i put in my body um, as far as food goes, but just in how I treat others mm -hmm. and how I look at other people who may not see the world I do with empathy and compassion, knowing I was there too. And not, I, it doesn't make me better that I was once like that, but I've just walked my own journey. Yeah. And I think that's like, that gets lost a lot in the food debates. It's like the, the idea that it's like, it's one way or it's the other. Well, maybe we have to find that commonality mm -hmm. and then have a discussion about it. And then maybe talk about the fact, like, is that, is it right? when you if you can bear witness to this footage is this right and how do we feel about it mm -hmm. and then the question once you become aware is well what am i going to do about it mm -hmm. and what can i do and maybe we can't change the system but we can change how we relate to it and that's yeah. that's the power lies in that yeah. decision right yeah. um and i think i don't know there's a it's very dark and it can get very dark and i think that whole concept of of like coming to consciousness can come with a lot of baggage emotionally um especially like when you're talking about like we live a certain way do we still need to watch it well i think the answer is yes like i think you know i think that's important i also um, feel like it restores your fuel to continue to push in and forward in your ethics and and live strong in that truth like recently a couple of days ago we actually watched a screening of uh, a new movie that came out um, by Kip Anderson. It's coming out. It's coming out. Yes, it's coming out. I've um, seen it. Yeah. You've seen it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and it was amazing. It was an amazing film. But it's been a while since I've seen a documentary about this topic because, you know, I've just lived my life as a vegan. And I, like I said, I know, I know how I'm living my life. I know what I'm not contributing to, and I'm just going to stick on this path. But even just to watch that, and I was heavy, I was very emotional. You know, I, yeah. I, I'm at this point where I, I, it affects me like physically when I see sure. pain like that, you know? So I was very, very deeply affected by it. And it restored this fire in me. You know, to if you're in a conversation with somebody and, you know, people talk about, you know, but I can't, I'm Portuguese, how could I give up meat? That kind of topic. And for me, it restored that fire to stand my ground, be like, no, like not just to passively say, okay, yeah, that's your life. It's like, but let's talk about it. Right. Why? Why do right. you feel this way? Like, let's educate each other. Let's have an open conversation. And I'll point right. fingers. Right. Because like Mark was saying, there are a lot of like angry vegans where people are just very, again, it comes that comes in a different energy for every person. And some people get very passionately 
mad and angry at the system. But I think if we approach it from a place of compassion and, and talk to each other and unite and bring each other together as human beings, as we all are, and, and talk about how we can be better. And I think just that idea of watching something that inspired me in that way, it just restoked that fire in me to, to fight a little it's bit good. harder. It's good. It's good because, I mean, it's, good's maybe an interesting word, but I know what you mean. Because we'll talk about uh, like cool um, technological innovations, mm -hmm. like in the food space, what they're coming up with, which is phenomenal. Not only like plant-based stuff, but cell-based stuff where they're really innovating and saying, all right, people aren't going to give this stuff up. Is there a way to do it without cruelty, with less water, with less environmental damage, with less, you know, antibiotics? Like, if they're just going to do this straight to the grave. Let's give it to them in a way that's more humane and whatever. So I look at all these arguments and I find them, I see them as efforts, mm -hmm. efforts in some way. We have statistics. We'll, we'll go through statistics and statistics are interesting. We'll do that. We'll do the science, we'll do statistics. The hardest thing to get anybody to look at is a clip, even if it's 30 seconds. Yeah. And yet I have found after over 20 years of doing this stuff, it is the most effective. Because yeah. I could drop some statistics on you and you might be like, whoa, mm -hmm. well, really? But it might not do it. Mm -hmm. Here, we'll do a little experiment right now. I'll tell you a story. I'll tell you a very short story. And unless I miss my guess, this will have an impact, probably because we're also story creatures people humans are story creatures so so we had footage once of um a baby calf being separated from the mom which is pretty typical for dairy right because as people know or if they don't know cows don't make milk unless they're pregnant just like humans all right but we're the only species who drink milk after infancy we drink another i don't know why we don't drink kangaroo milk i don't know why we don't put camel milk in our cereal but we just the cow milk so it's that it, it, that's how it was sold so so they take her away. She gets one day with mom and she's gone. Baby's gone. And so they usually bring in some kind of a divider. It's not a door, but it's like a light piece of plastic, but it's about the size of a door so they can maneuver it. And they just begin to sort of create this wedge between calf and mom and they separate. This mother, this mother is hitting her head against that thing to get to her baby just like you would and just like you would. She goes at it so hard, she breaks her neck. Wow. She breaks her neck trying to get to her baby. They still take that baby away. And after that baby's gone, that mother is hanging her head down, not just because her neck is broken, but clear signs of sorrow and grief and depression. And anybody looking at that who has any cognitive ability at all, any cerebral function looking at that is going, that is a depressed animal. That is an animal showing grief. And what's amazing in the footage is that the other mother cows came around and tried to bolster her up. Now that's more powerful than a statistic, that little story I just told you. Because you identify it. with it. We know so little about animal cognition. Party's over. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. I'm snowing full Ted Lasso here. No, um, that's, <laughs> wow. But I mean, it's, um. We know so little about animal cognition, and we probably don't want to know too much. It's easier to think that they're unfeeling automatons, you know, with no souls. Um, I heard once there's a myth, I think it came out of India. This usually gets me emotional when I tell this story, I and mean, maybe we'll see how we power through today, but... And the story goes that when you die, there's a bridge. Maybe you've heard this. No. There's a bridge when you die, before you cross over. And every animal that you've ever encountered in life is at the front of that bridge. And depending on how you treated them, they decide if you get to pass. You know, um, I'm not religious personally, but I love studying theology, mm -hmm. belief systems that people live by and die by. So you look at different teachers, Jesus said, Inasmuch as you have done this to the least of these, you have done it unto me, which was just a simple way of saying, recognize everybody is the same. If you study the New Testament, you'll see that Jesus taught a certain way for a while. It didn't quite work. It seemed a little bit maybe too heady. So it started getting into more of parables and allegories. It seemed to be that, the, again, we're story creatures. That seemed to be more assimilated by people. Yeah. So then you get like, okay, there's a Samaritan. There's a guy on the side of the road. 
he needs help. The Samaritan helps the guy on the side of the road. People are like, mm, I get it. And you get a little bit further away from the law of Adam or the law of Aaron or the law of Moses or the law, and you get a little more into specific incidents and people seem to click with it a little better. So when we're teaching or when we're trying to message to somebody, I usually tell a story yeah. instead of a statistic. Mm -hmm. But if I just looked at some footage in just a moment, but it's the hardest thing to get them to look at. Yeah. So it's a very, so we go through all these other, we go round and round and round to find other ways to reach people yeah. to get them to care. Mm -hmm. um, is, that, yeah. is that how you ended up making films that have the power to like to change? Well, I hope so. I mean, it's funny you ask that because I was just thinking that last night and this morning I was on, I have all the streaming apps right at home. So w whether it's Netflix or Hulu or HBO, yeah. I had the Criterion channel because I like looking at the yeah, old yeah. classics. I have that either, one too. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. either way you open it up and there's all these sort of thumbnails with a picture and a title and a year maybe on it. And I start looking at all these going, is there a way to make a movie? Because I think it's a great trans transference device, a great path of transmission. But it could not just be for the present, but could endure more because mm -hmm. you're going to spend the same time and effort and money. And what if you can make something that could serve not only the current generation, mm -hmm. but the following ones that could really endure? And I think about it, and not many do. Yeah, no, it's true. So I'm looking at titles are black and white, and I'm thinking, that's cool. I don't know if my daughter will ever be interested in watching something like that, mm -hmm. maybe. And I can't think of too many that transcend. There's one that comes to mind, probably the most popular, which is Star Wars. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 1976, 77, when it is. You're talking about almost 50 years. It's a long generations, time. Generations, 25 years. Two generations. That still resonates. Why? Um, so I often think about entertainment with a message now as opposed to less documentary stuff. I've been mm -hmm. pivoting since Unity on to do more narratives because... Um, there's websites like Statistica that'll tell you how things track and... Mm -hmm. For instance, they'll, they'll show you that the top 10 most popular genres in terms of box office, in terms of what people stream and why. And they do it by genre. So, so top 10 documentaries are number nine out of well, 10. Um, respected, but not nearly being seen as much as the other genres. And I've said to investors I go to when I try to raise money or donors and such, I said, we, we need to stop making docs or stop making only docs. Mm -hmm. They're cheaper. They're a little, I don't know if they're easier. It might be easier. I'm not sure anymore. I've done them for a while. They're not yeah. necessarily easy. <laughs> um, but I said, look at the statistics. Are, is it possible we're losing 80% of our audience by the genre? Because mm. they don't even want to press play. Like, you know, if fantasy is the number one in action and drama or two and three, like, why aren't we doing this? All the other great social justice movements, whatever they were tackling, racism, mm -hmm. sexism, you know, the treatment of children, the treatment of the environment, they've, they've been doing it in narrative films right. and series for a long time. Why aren't we doing this more? Um, uh, maybe that's a way. That's interesting. Was there, was there any films that I think connected some of this human to animal and the species the species connection for you when you were younger that yeah. helped you on your way? Remember like, um, and there's a, some old movies like Watership Down, which right. was a book, you know, of course, yeah, Rabbit yeah. Warren. And of course, uh, there's a really, really interesting one called Where the Red Fern Grows, which is about a kid on a farm with two dogs. Yeah, yeah, that's... And you're like weeping at the end. Weeping. Dogs old die. Oh, yell. <laughs> you start, you Benji, you know, you start looking at some yeah. of these and they just, they just, they just rip your heart out. Mm -hmm. um, there's a brand new movie, uh, called shoot it's a it's a foreign film so I, I don't want to get the title wrong i want to say it's like eo eo e literally eo um sort of the sound that a donkey makes eo you know yeah. it won it won the prize at the Cannes film festival this year or, or a co it was it might have been a co-win with another film it's about a donkey it's about a pack animal and they really tell this story it hasn't been released yet i just mm -hmm. read about it that you follow an animal getting handed off to another, handed off to another, handed off. Mm -hmm. And as you're watching it, you just begin to have this deep empathy for yeah. this life that's getting shuffled around, scared, doesn't know what's going to happen. Um, but that's super interesting. I think yeah. like we consume so much content and the average mm -hmm. human being, especially in this day and age, like there's so much content out there. And it really like, it's kind of like you are what you eat. 
you're also like your reality you're is shaped it. Yeah. by what you're consumed. And I think back to like being a kid for myself. No more cowboy. No, that's sure. it. That's it. Here, let's do this. Yeah, <laughs> let's evolve the conversation. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, but I think about like when I was a kid and like those connective moments, like Dances with Wolves for me. Yeah. yeah. I think like, that movie single handedly shaped my relationship to animals. Yeah. And to also like right. the, like just the, the, the crusade of Western culture into yeah. North America, like yeah. shaped a lot of political right. ideas. Mm -hmm. But the relationship he had with two socks, the yeah. relationship he had like watching the buffalo be massacred, right. um, like challenging the status quo of where he came from by being separated from it, mm -hmm. and then having to integrate back in and just mm -hmm. the shock of like the last. I don't know. There's probably three or four peak moments from when they like killed his horse and then yeah. they killed the house. That third act. The wolf? Yeah. Like, the when they killed the wolf. They killed was, the wolf. And like, the wolf was, was, wolf was diverting. Yeah. Like, that was like, that was the one time like, when I was like bawling. Yeah. I read the book as a kid. I, I still yeah. remember it was the first me time too. a book ever made me cry. Yeah. Like reading it, like crying, like on my own, being like, has this happened with books? Yeah. Like, but those were such powerful yeah. moments. And yeah. it's like hearing you say that, like, in this day and age where so much content's being made, like we say it all the time whenever we go to watch content because we don't spend a lot, a lot of time consuming anymore because I can't find enough things on an entertainment level that resonate my heart. Right. Because it just, there seems to be a disconnect and like, it's like the, the, the pandemic of Marvel movies. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. like stories, like, yeah. like you say we're story creatures, but we seem to be derivatively making the same like sort of plastic shallow thing. Mm -hmm. over and over and over and like i'm constantly like waiting for that next dance with wolves mm -hmm. right where i you know i'm not sure, even sure i guess records too you talked about moby yeah like for me yeah. it was like raging at its machine and propaganda yeah and both of them when you open the book like yeah. the liner notes as a kid like yeah. they're giving book recommendations right. and i'm running to the library and checking them out yeah. checking it out you know what i mean so it's, it's the like, power of the medium again so it's it could have been that we we you know ebbs and flows like with movies with, with marvel stuff i mean marvel is certainly Marvel is certainly aligned with maybe Joseph Campbell's The Hero's Journey. Right. You know, it follows a lot of those motifs pretty spot on. I think that's why people resonate with them. Um, I did an experiment with my daughter, my older daughter, my 21-year-old. She had a bunch of friends over this summer for her 21st birthday, and they were all crashing at the house. So it was about eight 20, 21-year-olds at the house one night. And Mira, my daughter, is like, okay, Dad, because she's a film major. Oh, wow. And she goes, uh, she wants to produce. And she says, Dad, I want, I told my friends that you're this, you know, cinema nerdo <laughs> with respect. And um, you get to pick the movie. What should they see? And um, so I'm sitting there going, and I'm just kind of getting a read on mm -hmm. these eight women, these young women. And three of them are big into horror. And some of them are still on their phones. So I'm just, I'm just kind of going off inspiration. I thought, well, there's a lot of pressure on me. Let me <laughs> it's crazy, right? Um, so I, I go, uh, I had this weird thought. I had a very odd, an odd film came to mind, which is a David Fincher film from the 90s called The Game that stars Michael Douglas. Oh, and, yeah. And, and it's, a, it's a mystery game. And I said, well, because I could tell some of them are into thrillers and stuff, but it's a very smart film. And I said, well, I got this idea for this one film. It doesn't really have any deep, profound message to it, but it's certainly a film about catharsis and redemption. And this, you know, one guy's really a prick in the beginning and by the end, he's sort of born again, you know, that's yeah. the whole journey. And not one, not two, but three of the young women give me this sort of disclaimer at the beginning. All of them. I mean, that's almost half. I have eight people sitting here and almost four of them are, are echoing the same sentiment, which is... Um, Sean, you know, I just got to tell you before you picked whatever this movie is you're going to make us watch yeah. before we were even born, <laughs> um, <laughs> whoever this is. And then they were really honest. He said, uh, uh, I have a hard time uh, paying attention. I have a hard time focusing. Wow. So I don't know if this is. And then the second one echoed it and the third. And it was, I thought that was very honest and transparent. And I said, all right, I don't want to ruin the movie for you, but I'll try to do a very respectful uh -huh. running commentary without messing anything up to just point things out. So we start the movie, which begins with a super eight, four by three aspect ratio of a child's birthday party, which establishes in the beginning that this is a very wealthy but dysfunctional family, that the father's cold. But if you watch very carefully, because Fincher's a very talented, masterful filmmaker, the aspect ratio is very, 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 gradually expanding so much so if you're not noticing it you miss it mm. and until it finally fills the whole screen and when we cut to Douglas now the boy from the eight millimeter is suddenly an older man 
you hear him splashing water on his face after he's shaved, and that's the first introduction of the character. And Fincher does something called a pre-lap, and I do this a lot in Unity. I did it a lot in my other film. A pre-lap is, is that you begin to hear the sound ahead oh, of time yeah. of the shot that's about to come up. I love that. It does something to your senses for a moment. Mm -hmm. So you're not seeing it. So for instance, while you're watching a Super 8 clip of a birthday party, you begin to hear a running faucet just for a second. Mm -hmm. There's a little uneasiness to it. So I just pointed little things out throughout the movie. Anyway, halfway through, I'm looking over and they're pretty much engaged in this. They're getting into this. Phones are aside. They're into it. And by the end, not to spoil the plot but it's a, the movie is called the game so through all of it it's all a misdirection there's a big twist at the end that's all been an elaborate game and the one the one young girl who was the adamant horror film buff and was like i'm not sure i can sit through this was like wait what <laughs> wait what like she was totally engaged so after it was over my daughter goes back to school and a couple weeks later she's like you know that's become her favorite movie she talks about it all the time she tells everybody should see it i said oh good this is sort of a film appreciation yeah. And what happens is you're just kind of just kind of breaking through the uh you know they're they're, they're raised on social media yeah so they're kind of inundated with that TikTok's probably the most prime example oh, uh, of yeah. it ever i mean who knew i mean maybe those masterminds knew that it would be the single most addictive app that we've ever come up with it's crazy the average like TikToker's on 19 times a day wow. for an average of 90 minutes that's a movie a day yeah uh, people don't log on to netflix 19 times no, a day for sure. um so we even talked about doing a movie exclusively through TikTok and releasing it in pieces and seeing, because what's cool about it is that if you release something like that, a one account that was donated to nothing but one piece cohesively all the way through, you'd even notice what scenes they rewatched or played more and more where yeah. they trailed off. Might be interesting metrics to do. I say work with it. I, you know, I, um, we're not going to pull them back into some old film school yeah. real For situation. Sure. So. Uh, let's reach them on their level and no. try to give them some sort of positive effect, mm -hmm. maybe. Do you, do you I think, didn't mean to trail off there, but... Uh, no, it's, it's a wonderful story. Do you think yeah. there's any um, filmmakers these days in the sto in the narrative side, like in the, telling stories? Like you talk about Fincher in this way of like the, mm -hmm. the subtleties of what's so special. Mm -hmm. Do you ever, have you seen anything lately that's just like... Well, there's, yeah, there's, sure, there's great, there's great artists. I mean, I'm a big fan of... Um, a lot of filmmakers that have nothing to do with what I try to yeah. do. I, I just respect their work. I, I, I'm a big fan of Ridley Scott, for instance. I've watched all his movies. I've met him, met him once, and um, and I, I think he's a um, he's got an eye like no other. If you ever want to see a period piece, he's made five period pieces yeah. where he's, he's in the past. I mean, you'd swear someone had a camera two thousand years ago during the Crusades, or sorry, the Crusades wasn't that long ago. So true though, right? But, and it just looks so spot on. Because if you if you were to talk to Ridley about why what's so special about your movies, he would say one word: reality. He's in, it's imperative to him that he takes you there. Hmm. However, in terms of like entertainment with a message, mm -hmm. yeah, a real message, yeah, yeah, it's a problem because it is a business and make no mistake yeah. like no one can afford to make a movie that people don't see right. i can't afford to make a movie people don't see yeah. mm -hmm. so unless you got some sort of foundation film fund and guaranteed distribution what good does it do if you make a film that people don't see so you have to find a way mm. okay fine let's just let's just take a step back and say this is the setup mm -hmm. how do we do it and still and still and still reach people like you hear about uh back in the 30s when some guy or maybe the 20s he wanted to close the patent office he was ahead of the patent office and he said you know i think everything's been invented we might as well just shut this thing down this is pre-world war ii this is this is pre-internet for god's yeah. sake um he thought everything had been had been done um you know henry ford when he came up with a model t he kept going around saying what do you want what do you want what would you like this is before the <laughs> horseless carriage had been made and they all said the same thing right Mm -hmm. Faster horse. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Got something like that. So that's where disruptions are interesting. Right. Disruptions come in. Mm -hmm. So um, maybe there's a film disruption. Maybe there's a messaging disruption mm -hmm. that we haven't yet quite quite cracked. You know, Uber or Uber or Airbnb, right. I mean, it, it, it couldn't happen mm -hmm. without a convergence of things really happening. Mm -hmm. A, the smartphone. Yeah. B, the cloud. And only from the smartphone and the cloud then could a new idea actually be revealed, right. which is the biggest cab company in the world that doesn't own a single car, the biggest real estate company, oh, in the, yeah. uh, hotel company in the world doesn't own a single hotel, mm -hmm. 
those ideas are a convergence of two other things that had to happen first. So disruptions interest me a great deal. And yeah. Can we learn from them and maybe find a way to help the earth and the animals and each other through some lesson in, in disruption? Well, I think if we go back to, like, just to bring it back to earthlings, like, I feel like that was a huge disruption for a lot of people. For a lot of people, because it was the first time they saw something that they never even thought was Happening. Real or happening, happening, right? Which is a tribute to the effectiveness of the marketing of the meat and dairy industry. I mean, it's yeah. brilliant when you don't think that leather comes from animals, that mm -hmm. cows mm -hmm. just sort of generate milk. And I mean, that is, I'd call it deviant brilliance, if I'm being honest. Yeah, but no, for sure. Um, but that is, um, and, the, you know, Big Tobacco was notorious for it for a long time, mm -hmm. right? We're doing a, a new film right now with Michael Greger, Dr. Greger, who he wrote, wrote these books, How Not to Die, How Not yeah. to Die, okay. How to Survive a Pandemic, Carbophobia, which is hilarious he's very funny so we're doing how not to die the movie that's no secret anymore we just started oh, wow. shooting it we're taking how not to die and making it into a movie so we just started filming it he tells funny stories about how big tobacco is very similar to the big meat and dairy industries they very similar tactics yeah so on a pack of cigarettes before the surgeon general put that warning on there this is unbelievable man what these legs these guys will go through to sell it took not 1,000, not 2,000, not 4,000, not 6,000, not 7, 6,000 medical papers, but 7,000 medical studies before the Surgeon General finally said, don't take my word for it, look it up. 7,000 papers before they finally said, all right, we'll put a warning on the packet. And Gregor says, you think after maybe 3,000, maybe 700, they give us a little bit of a heads up? Yeah. You know, like it's happening? No, 7,000 reports before they finally put that on there. That's why back in the 40s and 50s and 60s, everybody smoked. Um, uh, newscasters were smoking while they were delivering the six o'clock news. Johnny Carson was smoking on the yeah. Tonight Show. You're smoking in restaurants and airplanes. And you have this very, very small constituent of people going, um, I think this is actually bad for us. You got a big tobacco brought in, the athletes, astronauts, mm. John Wayne. Mm. I only, you know, I can't afford, I use my voice forever. I can't do a John Wayne impression. Yeah. Uh, I got I need my voice. And so to cool my throat, I smoke camels, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She did until he died of throat cancer. Um, they used all those tactics. And you'd go to your doctor. Your doctor's smoking. Yeah. He can tell you not to smoke. That's right. That's why fast forward to today, meat is the new smoking, mm -hmm. right? Your doctor's, everybody's eating meat. They get 20 hours of uh 20 hours of um, nutritional cover in how yeah. many years of school for exactly. like 10, yes. 8, 13, whatever, however many. I you think get that's 20 a hours. really key thing to just nutrition. highlight about, yeah. because it's astounding how we all turn to our physicians for advice. And, sure. And it's a natural thing to say, to turn to them for advice on food. Yeah. But what do I eat? Well, especially when it's affecting your health, right? Your diet is a, a huge part of your lifestyle. Health. Your lifestyle. Lifestyle medicine. Yeah. So, these lifestyle pioneers, Gregor's one of them, of course. Dean Ornish probably wrote the definitive one, I think in the early 90s, I'd have to check the date on that, which was, this actually causes heart disease. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Clapper tells great stories when he was an anesthesiologist. I think he was up in uh, Toronto. I can't remember if he was in Toronto, he was in Canada. Right. And he was learning to put people to sleep pretty much every time because they were cutting them open. Mm -hmm. And they were opening up and pulling out this, this uh, it almost looked like a, it almost looked like a long piece of pasta, except it was hard. Atherosclerosis, right? And they were pulling it out, and it's uh, it's plaque and cholesterol. Mm -hmm. it doesn't come from animals. It comes from, uh, I mean, it doesn't come from plants. It comes from animals. Right. Yeah. And he kept doing this, putting people to sleep, and he was getting into something called a hymns at the time, and how I got to be loving, and he was having his porterhouse steak at dinner with his colleague, saying, "I'm really thinking more about a hymns, and what can we do?" And one of his young colleagues is like. Uh, far be it from me to say, but you might want to start with uh, Stop what you're doing. And he's like, ah, he hadn't even thought of it before. He's That's been right. in a lifestyle advocate ever since. Right. Great, great, prof fountain of wisdom. Mm -hmm. All these guys. Yeah. Just awesome. But they too are a small percentage of people trying to say, do you know the number one cause of death among cardiologists is heart disease? The number one cause of death among heart doctors is heart disease? Are you fucking kidding yeah, me? Yeah, that's crazy. How is that possible? Mm. 
Sorry, forgive me. Um, no, no, it's astounding. It's me. astounding. It's totally okay. It's astounding. Like, I interviewed the chief of cardiology at Rush uh, University. And he says, I'll go do rounds in the morning. All these guys have had heart attacks. And I'll ask him just a few questions the day after, morning after the surgery. Hey, how you doing today? Okay. And, uh, all right. So, do you know what happened to you? I had a heart attack. Yeah, good. Yeah, that's right. You had a heart attack, and, and did they uh, they tell you? Uh, they tell you what caused it? I had some kind of uh, some kind of block, some kind of block. Right, right. They take they take the block out and tell you what it is. And he said it was uh, cholesterol and and plaque. He's like, mm -hmm. yeah, that's right. And then he says this to me. He said, he said I ask him this last question, and they all answer the same. Everyone without fail, I'll say, do you know how it got there? And all of them will say, I ate it. I ate it. So they realize it. Yeah. Now, if you have a heart attack, it's one in two. 50% of people die from a heart attack first time. That's a big number. That's crazy. I didn't that means that. no warning. Yeah. Wow. That means 50% died without warning. The other 50%, the heart attack was the warning. Mm -hmm. It's the number one cause of death today. Smoking's been bumped to number two. Number one cause of death is heart disease, and it doesn't come from eating plants. I don't know who the accountability should fall to. There is no big food company that you can go after like big tobacco. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just accepted. It's just accepted. This is this kind of death, death by food mm -hmm. is is totally right. But it breaks up families, children lose their parents, men usually more than women, although women die of heart attacks too. Yeah. Um so it's uh that's it's crazy noting. because it's it's a lifestyle, right? And if people start to understand like what you're doing within your lifestyle is actually contributing to you possibly losing your life. But it's so hard for people to change their lifestyle. And something that I realize even yeah. when you show the movies and, you know, the real facts of what they're contributing to, it's like, well, it's a difficult choice for them because people are so connected to their food and their habits. Yeah. And they yeah. don't know where to go. And so they rather just, oh, well, you know, that was a heart attack. I'll just mm -hmm. hope it doesn't happen again. You know what I mean? Like we have some family members that mm -hmm. they ha experienced, you know, health issues that are related to, sure. to food. And Common. they went through surgery or, you know, my aunt had breast cancer. She had one breast completely removed and she came home and went back to eating her sausages and yeah. her dairy. And, you know, and it was just... It's really frustrating when it's your loved ones, right? And you want yeah. to share this information with them, like, you know, just open their mind a little bit to start exploring alternative ways. But, you know, how can it has to come from them? That decision has to come from the person. It's an addiction. There's no question. Yes. Yeah. But how do we how do we affect more people to at least inspire them to look at the other ways that there are to live. I always say and answer that question, we're like gardeners. I figure we're just we're um we're casting seeds. Yeah. We hmm. keep planting seeds every day and sometimes it falls on uh rich, fertile soil. Sometimes yeah. a seed will really mm -hmm. and sometimes it hits stony ground and you just but we have to just keep uh sh messaging politely respectfully yeah, yeah. you know you're, there's a reason vegans are thought of is because too many of them have been angry which i understand because they first start to see what happens and they wake up to it and they're like whoa yeah. stop it's a hard right. wake, it's a wake-up call yes. and it's a hard thing to but it doesn't usually work to just go Never. Yeah. bulldoze at all mm -hmm. i mean you go into therapy if you're having a fight you start yelling to the therapist and go whoa whoa, whoa stop stop yeah. mm -hmm. stop so it doesn't yeah. work you know and then it reminds me actually um mark and i uh after we went fully fully vegan so we were vegetarian and we went vegan we started doing these pig visuals in toronto yeah with sure. uh, anita. anita yeah, yeah. <laughs> she's the start of it all really yes and you know we did a lot of bear witnessing and standing you know in corners and with signs and you know giving water to pigs and giving... yeah were you at freeman's uh, fairman's that? were you at fairman's um or? no there was a slaughterhouse downtown it was when it was downtown, downtown toronto, toronto. toronto. It was in the meat district it was on um, lakeshore there uh, was this lakeshore and they would the trucks would turn left to the slaughterhouse and it was a really long light and so that was you had a the, moment or some time. Yeah, it was a super time. long line. Yes. Was it cows? Was it pigs? It was pigs. pigs. And we would give them water in the summer because these poor pigs were right. just 
Like, the summer we did it was actually the heat. It was a heat wave in Toronto. It was yeah. a massive, massive heat wave. And I think it was before some of the laws to protect the pigs inside the trucks had been passed in Canada. Mm -hmm. So there wasn't a lot of legislation in place. And I think this actual summer helped a lot in Anita's movement to bring the awareness towards this idea. Right. And she brought us out. Um, I think we met her. We met her at a documentary screening for Joanne MacArthur's uh, The Ghost in Our Machine. She's, uh, Joanne is just, what an eye. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Great work. Unbelievable. Yeah. And somehow, and so Joanne and Dress just to Anita, and, and then, then Anita brought us to the pig vigil. And so we started doing it on a weekly, like almost daily couple, basis yeah, for a couple, couple of weeks. weeks yeah. um, and I remember, you know, it was that feeling when you're standing and, and just with a sign, you know, sometimes it'll be like, why love one, but eat the other, yeah. you know, those type of messaging and the people that would drive by and they need it to roll down their windows and scream at us, I love bacon, yeah. you know, like just to like hit you with this energetic force of like, oh, like really, you know, you're standing there and just trying to at least like support the idea of kindness and mm -hmm. compassion and just understanding. And these people are angry that you're standing there with a sign, like even though they're just passing by you. And they, they you know, in Western democracies, we do love the uh, we love the fact that we have free speech. There are parts of the world yeah. today, right now, where you can't even do that. You get yeah. in trouble. True. Yeah. So even those people passing by, mm -hmm. they may yell something at you, but if they had some issue they cared about. Yeah. They're glad they're here and they have a chance. Yeah. Or Canada, these these mm -hmm. Western thinking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it definitely seems to strike a nerve. Cuts a little close to the bone, pun intended, I guess. Um, uh, for people. I've seen it in my family. I've, they've watched me do all this stuff for 20 years. Yeah. I, a lot of them I haven't gotten through to, and I just think. And what, what do they you, say, your family you members? Like, what are their reactions to your films? I think that um, I think that uh, people just. Uh, I think the epiphany comes to different people in different ways. Yeah. Right. There's a lot of religious people, uh, religious members of the family, and I often think if it came from the pulpit. Lots of pulpits. Mm hmm. I'm not saying the Pope or the Dalai Lama mm -hmm. or a rabbi or a prophet of a various sect mm -hmm. has blood on their hands, but there are a lot of people who would listen to them if they actually said that, mm -hmm. if they stood up, because there are people who really listen to their yes. religious yeah. leaders. And if so, if some religious leaders stood up and said, hey, we don't do this anymore. We got to stop doing this. Mm -hmm. Sure, you'd have some... You'd have some grumbling and stuff, but you'd have some that would that are that do just like people listen to their doctor. Right. Mm -hmm. There was a woman I read something about. She was lactose intolerant, but her doctor had said something about you got to have those three glasses of milk a day. So she did it because her doctor told her. She always had an upset stomach. And, yeah. Mm -hmm. And someone, another doctor later said, "Well, why?" Another physician said, "Why do you do it?" And she goes, "Because my doctor, my doctor told me." There's that trust in that other figure. But there has to be free will. That's the thing. That's right. It has to be yeah. free will. You can't. You can yeah. just in, inspire and maybe encourage. But yeah. Well, you know, with free will and, and just the way the government works, like something that has really been a heavy topic is, you know, speaking of the vigils and and you've done a film on this as well. Yeah. It's the incident that happened. Was it a with Regan? With Regan. Yeah. 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 We watched your. Uh, the movie oh, there was a killing there was a killing there was a killing yeah, yeah. that was it was beautiful it was, movie. first time i did something investigative before because i hadn't done yeah. anything like an investigative journalism mm -hmm. yeah and it was really hard because you know the comparison of anita you know the one who started the pig safe right. having to be on trial for yeah. giving water <laughs> and charged criminally cr criminally right and then this truck driver that took a life ran over a Regan, mm -hmm. as she was peacefully, you know, rightfully standing on the side mm -hmm. of a sidewalk because she was in the way, you know, he was charged with traffic. What was it exactly? Like a, a. It was pretty light. Yeah. Like a, it wasn't even a criminal charge. Uh, there might still be something later they'll come back, but yeah. so far he's been. But like just seeing that comparison, you're like, how, how are we living in a just system when someone that's giving water to a being is charged criminally and someone that took a life? is not well and uh, the truckers association of some kind or union got together i mean they had a hundred thousand dollars raised for his defense within the first 10 days or something wow so, so animal rights activists are trying to raise money to raise awareness for whatever issue yeah and yeah there was a hundred grand put up right away for his defense 
I remember when they called me right when it happened. Uh, they started sending me footage right away to look at. Mm -hmm. And a couple things began to stand out to me because they sent me uh, all the, uh, there were six of them there, I think that day. It was pretty light, six or seven. And mm -hmm. between all of them, there was four minutes of footage. Wow. And I, I remember saying to Anita, I go, and Amy helped me on that too, mm -hmm. my partner Amy. And I said, um, that's it. Uh, I mean, with all these, with these smartphones we're all carrying every day with everything, like, you know, we, got, we only got four minutes of footage and some of it's the pigs in the trucks. I'm like, why don't we have more material? I said, listen, I got some tricks up my sleeve I can do as a filmmaker, but I can't, I, I, I can't. Uh, um, right. Asking me to make a, you know, a vegan souffle with just a few <laughs> ingredients in the cupboard. I'm uh, what? <laughs> Oh my God, dude, I remember feeling this great pressure because this woman had lost her life. Yeah. I saw yeah. an interview with her husband and I was, so his heart was broken and I, was, yeah. I felt this tremendous like, okay, okay, dude, like you gotta, you gotta like, you gotta dig deep and see. But all I had was very little mm -hmm. material. But in that very little bit of material was two little things that caught my interest. First, where her sprayer was mm -hmm. on the ground, mm -hmm. which was very close to the painted lines of the of the crosswalk and second was where her body was which was 70 feet and he was at a stop mm -hmm. this is a big rig this thing doesn't fire off the line at three seconds to 60 miles this is a slow thing with lots of gears yes. yeah. and i'm like he's at a total stop at a red light the light turns green and he makes this turn. He The impact had to be right at the crosswalk because she's crossing and that's where her sprayer got thrown. It's also as graphic as it is. The um, saying this with respect for the, the dead, but the body fluids pretty much starts right near the crosswalk and goes for 70 feet. And I'm like, how fast could he have been going? Or did he just keep, he, kept he didn't really stop right away yeah and we got footage inside the rig we use it in the movie because these guys would be posting on facebook hey look what i deal with you know i'm just a driver and every time i pull up to work i got a schedule and i got a bunch of guys blocking my way but it also showed just how clear you could see so we were pulling footage off that and we would fog anything that would be identified you know mm -hmm. they would identify who it was just to say hey here's here's a truck with a you can see everything right because they said i didn't see her yeah, yeah. See her. Yeah, no charges on that one yet. But you know what, you guys? I don't know. It's like the wheels of justice grind slowly, right? My dad's a lawyer. I've heard that my whole life. But Or or look at um, that Martin Luther King quote. We used it in Unity. The arc of human history is long, but it bends toward justice. So what happens is, is over time you start to see the truth of something and 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 hindsight is indeed 2020 mm. and um as victor hugo said in les Miserables, woe to the man whose shadow bears his form because in the future they'll look back and see clearly mm -hmm. what happened right it's like today you know no one racism was a world phenomenon for a time yeah no one today unless you're really depraved of mind appreciates the culture of racism you know when it was a culture mm -hmm. when it was a world phenomenon that everybody did was one thing but now later we look back and no one appreciates the culture of slavery it's it's we see right through it that's the evolution of consciousness too think at the time again i don't mean to go back to a religious example but at the time of christ they crucified people in in Rome, right? As you, that's what that's what Rome did, right? Yeah. Not just in Rome, but in Providence is yeah. Rome. They, you walked up to a city gates, and can you imagine? So right now we're in a town called Sun Valley, mm -hmm. which is part of LA County. Can you imagine if you guys drove into Sun Valley today to sit down here for this event and do this interview? If there were people's heads on spikes or being crucified along Latuna Canyon right here, which is just Sun Valley's way of letting you know, <laughs> don't mess around. This is how we handle. Yeah. Can you imagine? That's, that's, it's done. Yeah. But that was a thing yeah. 2,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. And in some parts of the world, there are still public executions and things. For sure. Happen. But we've evolved. So we start to see, ah, there is this evolution, the consciousness. We don't do that anymore. Yeah, yeah. The arc of human history is long, but it bends toward justice. But it is slow. And for some of us, it's it's too yeah. slow. It's As there are for other social justice movements are saying, hey, what about us? Like, what's yeah. it going to take? 
criminally slow, you might say. Glacier paced. Glacier paced. But bending. But bending plant, toward justice. And I like how you say the planting seeds. Yeah. You know, if we all continue to plant seeds. And I think um I think with your films you're planting incredible amounts of seeds, you know. If they press if they press play. Yes, as 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 long as you get them to press play. I think yes. that's that's what's so exciting to us about being able to speak to you today and to bring light to your film and hopefully inspire more people to press play. Um, and I think it connects really nicely to, I mean, you do a lot of work um, with Joaquin Phoenix. Mm. And I think that inspires a lot of people to press play as well because yeah. he's a familiar face and someone mm. that you have a trust as a character yeah. with, as, a, as an audience. What's, what's, what's that relationship all about? He's the real deal. I can say that much. I mean, he's a... Uh truly a guy that walks the talk so if you hear a profound um heartfelt speech for instance at the oscar it's oh yeah, yeah that, that was, was beautiful that was amazing I, he walks the talk i mean yeah. i i have known him for um i've known him for 20 years but uh, uh and it's just kind of interesting that we kept working together mm -hmm. I'm not sure how it's just we worked together once and then is it because later he's a just very happened, yeah. passionate vegan like is that how really he's, like, i assume that's where the connection the is connection the sure i mean I mean, when I was first doing Earthlings, I wanted to get, um, I hadn't thought of him at first. He wasn't my first choice, but I hadn't seen Gladiator yet. When I was starting Earthlings, it was 99. Gladiator came out in 2000. And I remember thinking, I want to get the most, I knew I wanted a male voice. I did. And I wanted the most manly, manly dude because I figured this is an issue that a lot of people are like, come on. Like, I need you my be vegan. Yeah. 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 So I was like, I'm going to get a total. And I remember shooting. I, I tried to get Clint Eastwood. Wow. I tried to get Mel Gibson at the time. It was easy. I tried to go for just big, mm -hmm. <laughs> big, huge movie stars. And I remember have what I call the confidence of ignorance because I just thought, here I am with my first film <laughs> doing a doc about animals. I can get anybody, yeah. right? I'll just ask them. And they'll be like, sure, kid. We'll be happy to be in your movie. And I got told no. Like, you didn't even get past several <laughs> layers or whatever. And I was like, wow, I was so super ignorant. And I remember seeing uh, Gladiator. And I'm sitting there and I'm going, which is a Ridley Scott film. Yeah. And I go, that's the voice of Unity. Uh, mm -hmm. Sorry, of Earthlings. That's the voice of Earthling. He's in Unity too, actually, mm -hmm. Joaquin. But um, I said, that's the voice. And I had no idea how to get to him. I didn't have any mm -hmm. connection to him of any kind. But I just knew. I'm like, I just, I just, I just. What do you call when you like know something just, without sounding too? Uh, felt it and, and just a sort of yeah. intuition or inspiration. Intuition, yeah. No, it's it. When you know, you know. It's just kind of new. I'm like, that's, that's fucking awesome. That's, yeah. I knew it. I'm like, that's it. That's it. Wow. That's it. Done. So I went to his, uh, he has a wonderful publicist, Sue Patricola, who I believe was River's publicist. Oh, wow. I'm not 100% sure, but I believe she's been with the Phoenix family a long time and she's was his publicist, still is, I think. I haven't talked to, I haven't talked to Sue since pre pandemic, but. And I said, oh, I'm doing this documentary about animals called Earthlings, how we treat them. And I'd like to see if Joaquin would consider narrating it. And I didn't get a response or they may have passed because he was busy. And I tried three times. I think I kept trying because I was so sure. Yeah. And when you're when you're in the industry, I think, it's, I don't know if I'm really in the industry. I'm on the outskirts of it going to mount a little dock. But you, you, you persist. But just shy of annoying, right? You don't want to be like uh, <laughs> That's a yeah. fine line of yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> you're like just, just shy of annoying, but you're trying. Like, come on. Yeah. And I remember Sue, bless her heart, you know, possibly slightly exasperated, just saying, "Okay, what? So what? You know?" She says, "Just send me a sample mm -hmm. of what you're doing." And I'm like, "Okay, okay, okay, you're on." And I sent a five minute VHS of footage that I had edited with my voice laid down and music and stuff and some graphics. And I did my voice in the beginning anyway. I did that on Unity too, because I wanted to get a bit of a, uh, of a pace mm. yeah, of yeah. how long it takes to read a paragraph or, mm. or read a sentence. And so I'll lay a voice down. I'll lay a voice down just to get that cadence. And then I'll start replacing that voice with a, if a celebrity voice comes in. So I had a sample, so I sent it off. And then that's it. At that point, it's up to the fate, destiny, right. the gods, whatever. And a few days later, I got a call. And she said, um, Joaquin will meet you. Joaquin will meet you. And I thought, wow. And I met him at the Peninsula Hotel. 
because he lived in New York at the time, but he was in LA. And uh, we sat down for a couple hours and just talked about stuff. And here I am thinking, as a director, I'm like, can I interview this guy for, no, this dude's interviewing me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if he's gonna like decide to Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. And he said, yes, he said, yes. And I go, great, when we started, he goes, I'm leaving for New York day after tomorrow. I said, can you record tomorrow? And I could see that he, he's, he probably had, uh, I don't remember anymore, it was a long time ago. He probably had a lot going on, but he said, yeah, come over. And we spent four hours that day. And then later we recorded again in New York. And then later we recorded in, uh, in Philadelphia. He was doing a movie called Signs with Mel Gibson, actually, at the time. It was a alien movie yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. they shot in Philadelphia. And I sent him a rough cut of, it was coming together. And I said, why, why don't you take a look? And he called me and said, hey, this is, he said, this is, this is, this is, this is coming together. He said, he said, can you come out here and we'll do, you know, some more inserts and pickups and stuff. And I went there and we recorded um, at the hotel there. And then uh, one more time back in LA, we recorded four times, which is why when I mixed the movie later, I could always hear, I can always hear the different room tone. I can pick it up. That's it, cool. It drives me nuts. <laughs> But most of the time I look over and people don't seem to catch it. So, but I always like, that's, that's a recording four months later, halfway right. across oh, the country. Cool. Let's yeah. Um, and then over, over the months or the years that followed, we just would stay in touch. And if there was some other issue I'd heard about, I said, Hey, you know, this thing's happening. And would you be willing to can maybe lend your voice? And he, he would usually agree if he could. So I don't know how the 20 year thing happened. It was just sort of, it's uh, beautiful. Over though. time, we just kept, we just collaborated last year on a thing for some chimps that were stuck at a facility that had closed and they had rehomed all the animals sanctuary. Mm -hmm. Chimps are very difficult to rehome. You find out these are not easy animals yeah. to care for. And both he and Rooney uh, came out and lent their voice and presence to that. So, and of course, the day after we won the Oscar, we did this thing where we rescued this calf. Yes, in it's the to go. Indigo, yeah, those Liberty and Indigo. There's two of those. There's two films. There's two parts of that. And he showed up. I remember calling him in the morning because we got a call. Amy got a call. So they'll because we knew this guy, the slaughterhouse owner. I still stay in touch with him, Anthony. Oh wow. He's always been very um friendly and uh we've had a very unusual um uh, friendship because he so, runs he, he runs a packing house. Wow. I've stayed at his home in uh and has he seen your on friends? the east coast. I don't think he's seen anything, no, but uh, he, he they Googled me. They looked up and said, oh, oh. Yeah. but I respected uh, the fact that he gave me time. Yeah. I didn't want to yell at him. I didn't see a point in yelling at him. And I didn't see a point. I didn't personally. Other activists might tell you something else, but I didn't see the point in uh, mm -hmm. shouting at him and judging him. I just of thought. And he opened and he gave me access into a slaughterhouse like I'd never had before. We've always been outside sneaking in, trying yeah, to get yeah. out, and he he let me come in. We were inside his facility. There's 14 USDA inspectors standing all around. And I remember when we were right by, this was kosher this day. Um, I think it was at the time might be two days a week. They were kosher. I'm not quite sure how all that works in one packing house, how they can change for this or that. Mm. Um, but I could tell you that the inspectors were all there, that they were following the protocols. And But I had never been in, inside before where uh, the rabbi was in right in front of me and the USDA inspector was right behind me. And the inspector said, can you see everything okay? It was a very unusual experience after 20 years of trying to get footage to right. have permission and to literally have the people inside saying, and then document and we brought we haven't released this yet the pandemic delayed a lot of stuff it didn't get finished it yeah. just got tabled but we did a thing with anthony who runs this slaughterhouse and we brought ian uh, ethan brown from ceo beyond me i call it the tale of two ceos i brought ethan to a slaughterhouse and i brought anthony to beyond me wow I, I both come visit each other and talk to each other and mm -hmm. talk about each other's processes that's super interesting wow. That's crazy. That doesn't come out yet. Yeah. And but Joaquin came out when the calf because Anthony called one day. And that was the, the day after the Oscar. He that, said, so he wins the Oscar and the next day he decides to do this. Well, what happened is it just happened to be the next day was oh, okay. Anthony called and said, hey, there's a, um, there's, a uh, there's a calf that was just born here. 
And um, Anthony is always uh, has called before when a, uh, a calf would be born, which I always thought was um, it showed it it, it revealed uh, he recognized that that this happens sometimes. Um, I learned not just at his his facility, but a lot of facilities. That what happens is is that the guys who are raising the cattle. This is cattle, for instance. Mm -hmm. They'll they'll sell them to the packing house. You know, they, 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 sometimes the deal could be sometimes. I don't pretend to know all the ins and outs, but sometimes the deal could be just between the guys raising the cattle and the packing house that will slaughter them, and that's one transaction. That's done. Those guys are paid for. Uh, it's not even by head. It's usually by weight. Oh wow! Wait, they're, okay, X amount of weight. You're paid. You're done, and then. The packing house will go through their whole process and then they'll begin, they'll sell them off to various places. So sometimes it can be, and sometimes these guys over here raising cattle try to make a little extra off the packing house while it's going in. How do they do that? Well, for instance, it's a, if it's by weight, um, how do you make the truck heavier? So they'll give them salt to lick before because they right. get thirsty, they'll drink a lot of water. So when they all load up, there's one weight, lo mm -hmm. full truck right. load weight. Then during the course of the journey, they might urinate out a lot of that stuff or they get pregnant before they even get on the truck, which mm -hmm. in this case, the packing house would know nothing about which ones are pregnant, which ones are not pregnant because he's not particularly involved maybe in where he's acquiring them from. Hmm. So that adds weight to it that is actually costing him money from a financial standpoint because these guys are all in business. Because he doesn't, he's losing, he's losing money from this because that's not sellable. Yeah. Product. So it's not uncommon that these babies are born often mm -hmm. at facilities. We've, we've been to other facilities and seen uh, cows that udders are full of milk, <laughs> just, just bur full of bursting. So, you know, they're pregnant or they just lost a calf or they're about to have a calf. So it's not uncommon. So anyway. I don't even know if Anthony saw the Oscars that night, the night that Sunday night. But a Monday morning, he just happened to call and say, "Hey, there was a, a calf was just born," mm -hmm. and um, so you know, if you guys want to come, you know, wow. see this calf, and we're like, "Can we have the mother and the calf?" Mm -hmm. and now he loses money on on the mother. Yeah. So we, you know, we appeal to his, we, we appeal to clemency from him, his mercy. You know, will you let you know? Yeah. And so. He said, okay, mother and calf. So I, I just thought, I called Joaquin. I, I talked to the Gene Bauer from Farm Sanctuary. Mm -hmm. I've also known Gene for over 20 years. Wow. And we worked out a thing and we went over there and I have a truck and a trailer. And we were going to go up to Farm Sanctuary, which is not far from here, actually. Too, not too, too far from here. And uh, Joaquin showed up and we had a little bit of a challenge with some paperwork. Yeah, because it has to go through the paperwork, right. which was a delay. But we finally got on the road, and I'll tell you, the energy of two places is un is palpable. Right, you really realize when you look at a place is it the land, not necessarily it's the intention. So when we were standing at the slaughterhouse, there's one feeling mm -hmm. that I'm picking up on anyway. Oh, for sure. And then an hour later, when you've arrived and you're standing at another place, there's a completely different feeling. And is it the is it the soil? Is it the tree? No. It's the intention of what's happening at a place. It's the they vibration. Pour, it's the vibration mm -hmm. you know, for people who understand vibration. Mm -hmm. Wow. So yeah, so that happened. And then a year later for uh, Earth Day, we went back to revisit her again and, mm -hmm. and see her, how she was doing. And this is an amazing shot we got, which is, if you watch it, that's Indigo. Mm -hmm. Liberty and Indigo are the two movies. You can see them on for free. It's so beautiful. This cow who he carried. Yeah, he carried mm -hmm. her. Yeah, he carried her more a year later. This is, yeah. this is a big animal. <laughs> But he carried her, uh, he carried her out of there, and he carried her out of the truck into the farm sanctuary. And she, I'm just sitting there. We had a couple guys shooting. We had some. It was terribly windy. We had all this dialogue. They were talking. Him and his sisters were there. Yeah. And his mother. And we couldn't. We couldn't use it because it was so windy. It was just. You know. You can yeah. appreciate sound. It was just. But we're sitting there trying to shoot it and keep all the dust out of everything. You don't really tell that this is windy, and when you're watching, but it was windy. And Joaquin just kneels down, and this, this she just walks right up to him just like what the heck she just walked right up to him 
Again, we don't understand animal cognition. Did she remember? Does she know? Yeah. We should he, know. When he was Think. in the interview, like I thought he would acknowledge maybe she remembered. I don't know if he said it. We don't know. But I, like yeah. that was the moment when we were we were all watching it yeah. and like the tears, like yeah. right there because yeah. of that like yeah. that deep knowing. Yeah. Like there there's an unexplainable deep knowing that that brought the calf to the one who carried the calf out yeah. of yeah. I think there's fate. definitely a connection. You know, we um, we did a little bit of work with Elephant Nature Park in um, Thailand. I don't know if you know of I've Lek. Heard of him, yeah, yeah. I, I, I've heard of Lek many times. She's okay. a hero. Yeah, I haven't been there yet to see it. Oh, it's so you beautiful. have to go oh one God. day. It's unbelievable. And um, we were, you know, we had an interview with her once, and she came to the sanctuary. And the minute she walks into the sanctuary, herds of elephants run to run. the small, tiny Thai lady. <laughs> And when you see that, Amazing. you there's no explanation. Well, the, like, of course, she's the one that's saved all of these animals. They know. They feel her. They feel her energy. Yeah. Like, I mean, we're all energy, right? We're vibrating this frequency everywhere we go. And there has to be something that the animals can connect to and pick up. I mean, it was the most beautiful thing to watch. And my, I remember my eyes and my jaw dropped. And you see these elephants. They would wrap their trunks around her. It was like... And it was just like... And trunks, just like... Just <laughs> all like, through. And again, uh, she's tiny. Like, she's shorter than me. You know, like, she's a small uh, lady. And it was so uh, beautiful just to watch that connection, like, of animal into human and them understanding it. They weren't doing it to all the other workers that were feeding them and, you know, taking care of them. But they knew the minute she stepped on the ground, you know. It's interesting that these chimps we talked about, when they were rescued from Lampsic, which is a lab up in New York... Mm before they came here they actually came there back in the 90s they're older chimps now but they're so smart what they would do is they were testing these chimps for all kinds of various things and so what they would do is that they would put a sticker on the cage at night it's a certain color it might be yellow or green or something i don't remember what color but the sticker is telling the evening the night crew it's a do not feed sticker because it's the same thing as they do with humans before you go into surgery they say don't have dinner the night before right the primates very similar, so they they put a do not a sticker that says do not feed on there, and the chimps were so smart that they pieced together whenever that colored sticker is on there, that means two things: one, I'm not getting dinner tonight, and two, something's going to happen to me tomorrow. Talk about cognition, right? Mm -hmm. So they would take the sticker off and they'd eat it and they'd swallow it, so they'd still get the meal that night, and they might go through and do the process the next day. But what was so interesting to talk about these researchers who came out of there with their experiences that they would they take the chimp away they do some sort of experiment patch the chimp back up and put them back in the cage and when the chimp woke from anesthesia they would sit there and just look at these scars that had appeared on their body and they didn't understand and they were they hurt to touch and they were there's one guy I interviewed a physician he wrote a book there was one chimp, beautiful female. I forget her name. They called her. Uh, she didn't have a name. She had a number. It's like B one eighty two or something was what how they referred to her. And she had very unusual behavior, where she would go up to the wall. The wall was all these square panels that were bolted into a wall. There was nothing you could see through. It wasn't a cage. And she would run away from the wall real quick, and she'd do like some sort of almost like a dance or performance and she'd run up to the wall and run back and they were watching going, what is she doing? What, what's, mm -hmm. and later they go inside when they're cleaning and there's a bolt missing from one of the panels. Now it's still just a bolt hole. You can't see through it, but on the other side of that wall is another chimp. When the bolt came out, she couldn't see the chimp. It was just a dark hole, but she knew enough to know that there was a chimp on the other side and she was trying to communicate you can see how we psychologically ruin this animal because she's trying to force her presence through a bolt hole to try to connect with something else on the other side. And these researchers start to have these realizations in there wow. about animal cognition and what they're aware of right. when they're looking at their scars, when they're removing a sticker. Yeah. That's it's the the connection, like each person at a different yeah. time, but I think those connections are so important. And when we recognize them to follow them and investigate. 
and the, whether it's the the truck driver at the vigils who joined the vigils you yeah. know because the, of the deep connection yeah. that something happened yeah. for or whether it's someone listening to this podcast and something's just shifting just right. slightly and if anyone is and that's happening like i think it's really important to encourage just like to exercise your sovereignty mm -hmm. and to follow what your heart is asking mm -hmm. and see where it leads because where it leads it's not it's not discomfort. It's yeah. you know, it's a deeper liberation. connection. It's really. liberation. It's awakening. Yeah. It's awakening. I like that. That's really yeah. Cute. It really is. It's a heavy thing. It's mm -hmm. like oh no, you're kidding. Yeah. But then you're like oh, my eyes are open. Yeah. And then you can start to shift. Yeah. Shift your lifestyle and perspective. And yeah. These days as well, you know, I think it's much easier than even it was 20 years ago to start to find alternative ways oh, yeah. to be healthier but also not contribute to right. a lot of suffering that yeah. can be avoided. You know? It's funny because my oldest daughter was funny. Like like I mentioned Ethan Brown before, uh -huh. I'll wrap up because I don't mean to drone on for you guys if this is going too long, but Ethan Brown's the CEO from beyond. So many years ago, he did a he did a thing where people can come over and taste it, tr tr try it. So we all go over to taste this beyond work. We hadn't tasted it yet. It had to be five, six years ago. Yeah. So Mira, my oldest is 21 now. She's raised vegan, born and raised vegan. Nice. That was just my one rule. I didn't impose any political belief or religious belief on her, but I said, look, you're not going to eat animals. It's just non-negotiable. I will feed you well, I promise. Yeah. I'm not going to eat them where or anything like that. So that was the deal. So what happened was, is we took her that night to this tasting, mm -hmm. this sampling of this beyond. And we took a bite. And I swear, we thought we were being punked. We thought they got cameras hidden everywhere. They brought in a bunch of <laughs> well-known activists who were adamant and they got us to all eat meat and they're going to like, we're exposed or something. And I was like, because I hadn't had meat since 97. That was the last time I had any meat. And I remember going, this is unbelievable. And I'll never forget my daughter. She tried it and she goes, so, uh, so is this what it, is this what it tasted like? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> she, she has no point of reference. She'd never tasted it before. Wow. And I remember going, whoa. She just, she just had never tried anything. Wow. So we no were all blown around. away because how similar it was. Right, right. But she was like, I don't know, is this... Yeah, this, uh, the first time for cool. me trying that was pretty... Yeah, Beyond Meat? Pretty, I mean, since me, it was the late 90s as well when I gave up meat. Yeah. Um, and so that was like a yeah. like a weird time portal. Yeah. How they've managed to synthetically manufacture the exact same experience. I Ethan's think... great though, because he would say, I can't remember, I shouldn't quote his story exactly, but he said to me once, he goes, how come if you buy a piece of frozen chicken and you tear off the cellophane and you smell it, it doesn't smell good. If you stick a frozen chicken in a microwave and just microwave it, it's not going to taste good. Mm -hmm. If you just heat up a frozen chicken. Yeah. Like no. He goes, how come, same with raw meat, how come you can tear it off and smell it's not good, but if you put it on a barbecue, something goes, ooh. ooh. He goes, what is the biology that does that? And he says, and if, if that can happen with meat, could I take soy or some other compound mm -hmm. and biologically, it may also not smell good, the raw vegetable or the raw alternative protein. And can I trigger the same and that was kind of one of the origins of it's interesting exploring it, which isn't the first time we've manipulated food stuff for a long time, whether it's olive oil, whether it's ice cream. Um, look at fermentation. Look what we've done with beer. Alcohol. I mean, that, that's a manipulate that is a processing. Right. And so this is hardly the first time that humankind has tried to dabble in this. The cell based meat is really the next big one. Yeah, it's really the next big one where they take that one you know, or two cells. I had a chance to visit one of the facilities and literally look through the microscope and watch the cells. Wow. And in three weeks, they go from a Petri dish in an incubator that looks like a refrigerator to an animal product with no central nervous system, no spine, no pig, no screaming, no antibiotics, no water on that level. It's so... It's innovation. Wow. It's truly an innovation. Wow. It's going to take me a while to get my mind wrapped around that. Because, but think about it this way. Um, they start as a hybrid, right? So it might be 80% plant product, 20% cell-based or something, mm -hmm. right? To give it a texture. But 80% um, of our antibiotics go to animals. You probably heard that statistic. I didn't know that. 80% of our antibiotics go to animals. Now, this is a statistic. 
that may not be as influential as the mom and baby calf story I told you earlier, but 80%. Do you think the pharmaceutical industries want animal agriculture to go away? Yeah, no, for sure. 80%? Wow. 80%? I feel like I have to say that like repeatedly over and over, 80%, and you think you can cook it out? So it it goes into humans, right? That's why we have superbugs. That's why we have these problems. Salmonella, which is which is essentially shit, right? Which we end up getting in our in our spinach and stuff too. So we're wondering as fertilizer how this stuff is is getting mm-hmm. into people. But there, it's truly clean meat. Mm. Yeah, it is truly clean meat. So if you said you were thirsty and you needed a glass of water, and I went in the, there and I brought you a glass from the toilet, would you drink it? No. Why not? It's water because it's contaminated. But if I could literally say to you, because you're bent on eating meat, nothing will make that change. Here is clean meat. Mm-hmm. Here is meat with no antibiotics. And if you give a shit about the environment at all, it had no environmental impact or very little environmental impact. It would save animals. It would help animals. It's so interesting. You're going to hear two different thoughts on that because you're going to hear some adamant purists who'll be like, how dare you? Sean, on earth, how could you? I know humanity. I've seen too much of it for 20 some odd years. Yeah, I know yeah. humanity. And if this will help them not do that over there, yeah. then that's then it's by degrees, right? The thermostat doesn't just jump to 101, right? It's, mm-hmm. it's 98, yeah. 98.2. Yeah, yeah, 98, yeah. But so these guys that are doing that, I'm not doing this, but these companies that are innovating that. That's crazy. It's, that it's, is crazy. It's, 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 it's really innovative. It's the only word. Right. The outcome, I think that's what's important for when I have mental hurdles to jump over. I think the outcome that you said there, not to, and the, the analogy with the water is so, so intelligent right. because when I was a kid, I drank water. Sure. Now I won't touch tap water right. because I've understood the contamination. Right. It's still so, water though, right? So there's, yeah, right? Water, but you're like, well, wait a minute. Wait, yeah, what's in that water? Clean. Yeah. Totally. That's interesting. So that's and then, but the outcome of that is lives and suffering is reduced. Substan- uh, tremendously. Yeah. Right. And it's, it's, meatless Monday can drop however much the numbers are when one day is stay. I mean, mm-hmm. Imagine then if, if your sausage, your pork, your bacon. Um, I, I wouldn't have a head to start a business like this. I don't know how these guys do yeah, it. There's yeah. several out there. There's several companies that are innovating mm-hmm. this way, but I really tip my hat to them to say, mm-hmm. No. So, but purists might say, "Hey, you're still condoning eating animals." And, um, um, well, like I say, I know humanity. And if why hasn't it worked already? We've said everything, done anything. We've written all the books. We've made all the movies. We've brought in all the movie stars to talk about it. Why isn't it over? Like mm-hmm. it's done, right? Yes. Do we have to say it another way? I yeah. Mean, yeah. What, what do you? What do you? You know? Okay, let's try this. Yeah. Interesting. So I commend these guys. I. I commend them um, whether I buy the product or not or yeah. something else. But I, I, uh, at least it gives people an opportunity to at least slightly shift if they can't. Yeah. You know what I mean? Fully go. Still might give you heart disease. It still has fat in it. It still has yeah. cholesterol yeah. in it. It still has no fiber right. in it. Yeah. What about what's but, next for you? I mean, you're saying you wouldn't start. You don't have the head for a company like that. Do you have another movie in the works? I do. I have a couple. Uh, I'm going to do How Not to Die, of course, which we're doing, which is 2024. Um, because we're shooting all next year. We started this year and Gregor just started giving talks again. So he's just been following around whenever he speaks. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I've got this other business that isn't related to film that I'm getting off the ground. It's super edgy, weird. I can't talk a lot about it, but it's <laughs> a year from now you'll hear about okay. it. You might even hear about it in the spring okay. if we launch, but uh, it's something totally different than I've ever done. You might think like Earthlings Unity, like how do you go <laughs> to here? But I got this idea. For something that it, that is a that is a product, it's an alternative product, um, and then I've got narratives. I've got these narratives that I've been working on for years that we're packaging and trying to get off the ground because uh, they're they're message based entertainment. That's so exciting. That is because you know what really blew me away was a movie called JFK. And if you haven't seen it, of course, yes, 19, Oliver Stone. 1990. Oliver, Oliver Stone. Stone's, I love Oliver Stone. Ninety one, maybe. This is hands down the finest docudrama mm-hmm. ever made. Um, what and it doc- changed legislation. It had the power. It changed legislation and it really pissed a lot of people off because <laughs> but what I loved about it is that he took an actual world event. He got actual footage. There's the Pruder film. Yeah, yeah. And he went and refilmed there and he and he shot with big, awesome 35 millimeter cameras. But he also th- shot with Super 8 cameras. And so he mixed all these formats. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so that's truly a docudrama because it isn't a drama. But it's documentary. I mean, it's weaving it in. And I thought, 
I, I looked at that movie as a really as like, can't we do something like that when we talk about climate change or we talk about animals? Uh, when I did Unity, I couldn't figure out why we've why have we been at each other's throats since the dawn of civilization? The statistics yeah. tell us that man has been at war for ninety five percent of of civilization. Ninety five percent. So there's five percent there we weren't at war. Was it because we were too sick? Was there a black plague? Like mm -hmm. we, we, our our propensity is is, is is to come in collision with each other with our ideas. yeah. So why can't we get along? We've been black, white, gay, straight, fat, skinny, uh, Jew, Gentile, you know, like heathen. Like we've been all these things since pretty much the dawn of civilization. Yeah. Right. There's no revelation there. Like with all our innovation, with all our technology, with all our symphonies, with all our architecture, with all our poetry, the fact that we've gone to the moon and into this, like with all this, we're still like... I savage think. like savage and i remember this possessed me after earthlings like why like why why haven't we transcended yeah that now more than ever it seems in yeah. this country there's this yeah. deep 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 division it's crazy. and to me it comes down to a form of tribalism that is still inherently deep within us and uh um tribalism and uh mistaken identity Mm -hmm. We literally think I am a this and you are a that. Mm. And therefore we we're violent with one another. And, uh, you know, I made a movie called Unity, which is a follow up, which is really about disunity. If you watch it, right. it's one example after another of why we can't transcend. Um, so if we can't it, it, listen, if, you know, they say that we're our compassion is closest to our reflection. That's why white people might be nicer to white people. As soon as your reflection in the mirror, when you step away from the mirror and that other reflection that's looking back at you differs from you more and more and more and more, there's less empathy, empathy, empathy. So by the time you get to an animal, let's say, or maybe a little more compassionate for a koala bear or something cute, you get down to a rat, you know, or something else, you have less and less. Yeah. You get into the insect kingdom, it's completely alien to what the reflection in the mirror would be. And by the time you're looking at a tree like this beautiful one here, I mean, how could you have any empathy for it? It's so far from... So the idea of that movie was no separation based on form. It's so beautiful. No separation based on form because because life expresses itself in multitudinous forms. It's always been that way. Yeah. It's been black and white. It's been mold. It's been penguins. It's been sharks. It's been earthworms. It's yeah, been, yeah, yeah. It's, you know, it's always been a multitudinous expression of life. So to say, I love this form, but I hate this form, is a duality. Mm -hmm. Is a duality, and it's taught. It's usually taught. If it's not taught, it's acquired. So if you want to talk about self-exploration, you mm -hmm. just look at that for a minute and say, why do I love this and hate that? We saw it in some Nazi research I did where there's one guy who used to bring people to the ovens. This horrific incident, the whole episode, as it were, in, in human history. But this particular Nazi would would bring people into the ovens. They just, you know, moving them in. And one time this 10 year old girl came in who was just absolutely psychologically shattered because she'd already seen her parents die and had lost. And here she is in this camp and she's marching to her death and she's she's in such a haze and, and of this psychic violence and probably physical violence, too, that she's stammering and she's moving slowly. And he rifle butts her in the back of the head so she'll go into the oven faster. And this particular Nazi had two 10 year old twin daughters at home and was known as a loving, compassionate giving sensitive father their whole life mm. talk about the very definition of a duality mm. it, it 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 shocked me that not that we were capable of violence but that we were capable of love mm. because on the one hand you can love something and cultivate that love but have an attitude of aggression toward another thing based on form Based on form. Based on form. And I just thought, we got to analyze this. So Unity took seven years of my life and all this stuff. And it, it wasn't seen by a lot of people. I watched it sail right over a bunch of people's heads. And I was like, okay, now to sell from the next one. Yeah, Maybe yeah. dial it back a little. What did you learn from that? Um, seven years. Yes, that's... And another year to get distribution in seven years since because i haven't made a feature film since unity i've made a lot of other stuff in between yeah to develop a lot but i don't know i don't know how honest i want to get with you thing here but i mean i've, I've i often debated if uh if i could do it again if i would or if i should do something else because wow. again we can't afford to make films that people don't see and we had a hundred narrators on that one, 13 oscar winners it's never been done before the idea was one voice is a tapestry of voices yeah. it took forever 
I remember I was like 45 voices in and I thought, maybe this is a bad idea. Like, this is taking forever to coordinate with all these people. Right. <laughs> to be, they all read pieces of right. snippets of stuff. Oh my goodness. It was like a hundred voices, but, and it just, it, it got picked up for distribution, unlike other things. It did get picked okay. up and went around, but it was not widely seen. So How I think we need a Trojan horse more. I think we need a Trojan horse. Yeah. What do you mean by that? We need a Trojan horse. Uh, Trojan horse is a bad metaphor because that's from the, from the Greek myth of you know the Iliad and the Odyssey. But they used a, a, a Trojan horse to get inside, as a gift to get inside, and then they slaughtered everybody. <laughs> we'll say a Trojan unicorn or something. <laughs> we'll soften it. But the idea of the package being presented as something far more appealing mm. and less didactic right. and heavy. Maybe a good podcast like this with a beautiful, happy young couple that travels around has hopefully interesting. We haven't hopefully bored everybody to tears, you know, like interesting conversations that maybe people will listen to. I think, yeah, I mean, Car I like your idea of the narrative, the narratives that you're working on. I yeah. think that that's an attractive yeah. new Trojan unicorn, possibly. Yeah. Hey, I don't know. No, get them to press play. Yeah, exactly. get them to press play. Just keep your mind open. Like, keep help keep people's minds open to just, and it's that, that's the excitement of this day and age, I think, is that. I think COVID might have helped a lot, but yeah. the idea that it opened like, a lot of people's eyes for, for sure to start to question a lot of to things, question things and to question narratives, to, introspection, maybe introspection. Exactly. Oh my goodness, right? And like to, what an opportunity! Yeah, people people embrace shift, and I think now it's coming out of that, shift. I think there is a consciousness that's saying, for a large majority of people, right. they're open to critically thinking what they already thought they knew. Mm -hmm. And I think that's like- If they that, weren't open before, they're more open now. For sure. Yeah, there I is mean, a bit of a shift of consciousness growth, that is happening right now that- Growth and expansion, yeah. personally. It's like, that's yeah. the pursuit of being a human. Right, Like, like hopefully. Hopefully. <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> yeah. It's the arc, we could be right? stagnant. That We could be stagnant the whole time. Well, we're arcing towards justice. Toward justice, please. Let's hope. Yeah, I mean, you know, walk a mile in their moccasins type thing, you know, it just- uh, these metaphors and expressions, they are trying to say something. And usually you do. If you hear a story of somebody for a minute, you might be like, ah, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. There's a human connection, a connection. we all yeah. share. Yeah. And I, I, and I don't a know. To... I think that's why we're super grateful that we could sit here and hold space for a conversation like this. Because, you know, like you, like you said, if one person, if it helps one person, it doesn't even have to be changed their diet, just change their perspective, yeah. put that seed. Positive effect. Then this two hours or hour, or what? Yeah, I don't even know how we've been yeah. in this weird flow state. I have no idea yeah. what time <laughs> has been for the last little bit. You mentioned COVID, uh, maybe we'll end on this. I During COVID, I did a video for um, Lolita, the whale that's in, uh, the, the orca, I should say, that's in, orcas are from the dolphin family, technically, not really whales, but we call them killer whales. Anyway, uh, she's been in this Miami Sea Aquarium f for a long time. and. It was came to my attention right during COVID that the uh, 50 year anniversary when she was captured was coming up. And so I put together a little video and I sent it to some people and said, how can we, what can we do? You know, the activists and legislation even have been trying to free her for a long, mm -hmm. long 50 time. years. So what happens is she was ca captured off Puget Sound, Puget Sound, Washington state. She was captured in 1970, uh, 1970 actually. And uh, she was four, she was four years old, which means she already knew how to fish she already knew how to communicate with her pod. That's her family, and um, they were capturing they were capturing orcas back then and selling them to marine parks. So I put together this movie. It's called Orca Cowboys, and it's about the guys that were going around and, and capturing them. And I did a teaser for it. I should share it with you guys. We haven't released Please it publicly. It, yeah. It's just this little thing we started to do. Let's say because I thought during COVID, people cooped up mm. might correlate more than ever before with what it might be like to be cooped up. Mm -hmm. That was the thought process, right? And I thought, okay, let's do one thing. Maybe let's just save this one orca. Mm -hmm. That's really cool. Anyway, so she was captured in 1970 and they and she was sold to Miami Sea Aquarium. So, and she was taken and she was delivered there in September of, uh, maybe it was 71 actually now. And so, and I we have footage of her being lowered into the tank for the first time. Now it's an 80 foot by 40 foot uh, pool. We have drone footage of it that's really, incredible and it's 20 feet deep at, at, at its deepest point and as you've heard you know it's like living in a bathtub or probably an elevator is really more of a not that that's any better metaphor than a bathtub it's a little bigger but and an orca will swim 75 to 100 miles a day um so this to me is unspeakable cruelty yeah it's probably longer than animals in any animal ag situation because their death is re relatively immediate chickens live 52 days although it's a lifetime to a chicken, so it's relative. 
but uh, in September to have been in the same tank for 50 years. She's never been sold and transported to another facility. Never. Wow. No, she's just been there oh my God. this whole time. Others have, have died that have been captured. Uh, they die for different reasons. They get sick or they die. Some have smashed their heads into the wall until they die, which is an interesting talk about cognition. Some have turned themselves over and opened their blowhole and drowned themselves, which is... Uh, uh, but Lolita has, has lived on. Um, here's the kicker. They know her pod because they're tagged. Some of them have been tagged and they know her mother. Females will live up to 100 years. Males maybe 60 to 80 years in the wild. Um, she's one of the longest in captivity. Her pod returns to Puget Sound every year and calls for her. No. And they thought it was a good idea to take a recording of the mother and they took it to this aquarium and they put the speaker on the edge of the water and they played it so she could hear her mother. They thought, and she went crazy. She went nuts. So what we did is we reached out to some people and we said, what can we do to get her out of there? And I'm just a guy that this is not rich or anything, but makes some movies. And I called, I knew a few people and we found out that uh, Miami's Aquarium was owned by a facility actually in Newport Beach at the time. Wow. And that facility, and that company was owned by another company in Spain. And that company was owned by another company in Zurich. So we went all the way through this process and I happened to have a friend in Zurich who's quite influential. And I said, same for Roger. I said, Roger, can you do me a favor? Can you just do a little investigating? Mm -hmm. This is how change happens. Maybe it's just two guys who have no connection to nothing. Right. Maybe a few phone calls, who knows, maybe not. Others have tried, PETA has tried, many worthy groups have gone and given it her a Herculean efforts to try to get her out of there. And he found out, yeah, I'm like, who's the top spot? Forget mm -hmm. this aquarium, forget these guys. Who's the guy or woman, man or woman up at the top who could say, release her. And the rest down the line couldn't say squat because mm. yeah. it's coming from the top. Let's find that out. And it was difficult to find out, but he kind of got an idea of who it probably was. And, and still it's such a conglomeration of some kind. Yeah that it just kind of got lost. But he was trying to say, hey, listen, I'd love to work with you guys on this or that. But by the way, you have this little tiny fish over in this little <laughs> pool. And he's like, we do? We have a, you know, do we? Because they own some different marine parks. Point is, we weren't successful. She's she's still there awesome. right now. And I think they've since sold uh, their shares in that or that to it, probably another entity that I think is in Mexico now. Wow. But can you imagine what it would be like if they said yes, and we brought oh in, God. you'd have to bring in the vet techs of some kind that know this. We were setting up a deal through Amazon and Whole Foods because we have connections with them for transport because mm -hmm. Amazon can transport to get free transport. So wow. we were talking, it was starting with Whole Foods to be involved if we could get her. And we were going to film it. We were going to film her coming out and we were going to build a sea pen uh, near Puget Sound so she could go back to the same waters and go in. Now the idea in the movie would be to show split screen on the left side the old black and white footage of her going in oh and my 50 God. years later can you imagine you got oh. Oh my God. I just gave me goosebumps. with the water coming under her wow. and her coming out and we get her and no orca has ever died in transport before and we'd tell the audience we'd tell the world in advance she could die she may not survive is it worth it for one day of freedom for seven days of freedom for six months of freedom for one year like, would you want it? That's how I would mount it in the film. Yeah. I'd, just, I'd get it right out in front. I'd say, do we do it? Because they're saying she'll die. They're saying if you release her, it's cruelty. It's cruelty. She's been fed, and that's true. For 51 years, she's been fed. But I'd say, let's try. Let's, and who pays for this? You'd have to have a lot of money. And get the C-pen and bring the vets there and monitor, make sure she doesn't develop any pathogens, make mm, sure she doesn't yeah. start feeding again. But imagine, you guys, if it worked, if she survived. And when her pod came by again, freedom is a choice, right? You open the gate and go see. Who doesn't want to free a whale? Who and doesn't want to free a whale? Yeah. But, or I should say an orca. But here's the thing. If they do that, Every other animal in a marine park anywhere else in the world is suddenly like, what's this animal doing here? It'd be bad for business yeah. to ever release. Is that why you think you got shut out of this? I can't deny that that's not a big part of it. Of course, right? 
Well, it sends a terrible message. It's like when Blackfish came out. Yeah, as soon as one's yeah. free, what are the rest of them doing exactly. here? It's a, it's a domino effect. We can't do that. Are you still going to work for it? Oh, yeah, we still try. Are you still, like, what's, we, is there a plan in place to continue the... We, 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 it's funny because I pitched this. I pitched this to Apple Plus. I had a pitch with them. <sighs> my, agent, uh, my agent calls and says, hey, Apple Plus, you know, seen some of your docs, and they, they want to hear what you got. And I'm like, and I usually go with a pitch. I'm like, okay, I just go on intuition. I'm like, hmm, what do I pitch him? Because I got a few things. Mm. Like, well, what do I... Which one did I pitch? And my instinct was like, Orca Cowboys, Orca Cowboys, Orca Cowboys. Talk about Lolita. It was like screaming at me yeah, from yeah, yeah. whatever that Again, is. Again, that's that voice. So I get there. There's two wonderful women from Apple Plus who I'm on this Zoom with. And they said, what would you want to talk about? And I said, well, have you heard of Lolita? And I tell them everything I told you. One of them seemed a little bit like, mm, mm, mm. But the other one seemed like she was deeply affected, mm -hmm. at least as far as like my uh, appearance, it seemed. Right. And the, and, and the one uh, the one who maybe was a little more standoffish, she said, um, how far along are you? And I said, we're, we're, we don't have permission to free her yet. And she goes, why don't you come back to us when you're further along? I said, wait a second, hold on a minute. You're Apple Plus. If you came on board this without the ending known, it legitimizes it in a way that never has been before. It'll open doors. Yes. She goes, well, that's not really what we do. And I said, but, but, Look at 60 Minutes, like story, it's been on for forever, like stories that don't yet have an outcome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's yeah, It's exposure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like if you ever gotten behind a film before that didn't have its ending yet, that it could go either way. If it goes the Rocky way, uh -huh. we lose. Mm -hmm. If it goes like Rocky, Rocky, he loses at the end. Yeah. He's the underdog and you're rooting for him the whole time. I said, do this, you guys. Do this more than you've done any documentary because it's more than a film. It's more than a movie. Yes. In fact, the movie is just the documentation yes. of, course. of the intention. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They passed. They, they passed. passed. They passed. And I thought, Ugh. I said, I'll pull in. I'll pull in every heavyweight I know. I guarantee it. I'll pull them in. If, if I have to do a kick in the screen, I'll get names. I'll get you A-list names. It's one thing I've always done. I don't even know how. Yes, you do that. You I don't know can how. do that. That's the truth. Right? I have better luck getting names than I do raising money for projects. But I, I can do it somehow. I said, but we'll get them. But, and it won't cost you that much. Mm -hmm. We'll do it like, but if Apple Plus got behind it so that the companies knew you guys were investigating what happened, that you were doing a film about it, and we're not gonna condemn, we're not gonna point fingers. No, you're just gonna free a fucking whale. We're gonna free a whale, and this is about redemption. Oh, we're not gonna God. say, look what you've been doing. We're not gonna throw you guys all under the bus, so to speak. Like, let's work with them. Mm -hmm. Let's see if they'll help us. Yeah. Because to me, Lolita was a microcosm for the freeing of any other animal. And it was easy because she was this beautiful being. Yes. She's sick right now. She's sick. You know, they were worried about she's not going to make it. She may die in that pool. Oh my she may God. die in that pool. She's been there through every hurricane that's blown through Miami. She sits there. They batten down the hatches. She just lays in that water. We have footage of her just as early as this summer. And she just almost like this buoyancy she just sits there with her her you know her snout just above and just doesn't really move there's just sort of she's, zombified yeah. her spirit is broken but she's still living but she's still and living. i want to see you know and is it cruelty what's bringing the best experts yeah. there's a native american component who believes that she is their uh I don't want to skip my facts wrong. I think they believe that she could be her chief or uh, reincarnated. So yeah. we want to respect that. But the idea of to try. Of course. And I did it once before with, uh, you know, the movie Free Willy from the 90s. Mm -hmm. That's based on an actual true story. And, and that whale. Um, Keiko. Keiko, thank Keiko, you. Keiko, the untold story. That's one of your favorite movies. That's one of my favorite Keiko, movies. Keiko, I was just thinking, oh, the name they of They built this whole tank in Oregon or somewhere to rehabilitate To him. rehabilitate. And then he went to... Um, Iceland. To Iceland and he lived for a Two while. Two years. Yeah. And then he explored and... He did. He died, like, I think, yeah. of pneumonia. And, and they said, see, but Keiko was never reunited with uh, his pod. Mm -hmm. Never reunited with his pod. The idea would be to get Lolita back with her pod oh. and see would they accept her mm. would they reject her but would freedom in the open sea be better than that pool even for just a day mm -hmm. just yes. to die yeah. just to die yeah to die as she should and She's... fall to the bottom of the sea and then other animals can feed on her and do whale fall they call it whale fall what i wish we... you guys i wish i was a billionaire I sometimes know, like, what can we do like this is what i would do i'd be like 
Can we start a petition or something? A fundraiser. Like, we, we tried it forever. Like, you can try it again. We try it yeah. again. Well, they did it with Keiko because they were like, okay, they free had a Willy petition. and they didn't free the orca. Something else happened with Keiko that was interesting was, I'd have to get my facts checked, but there was a story of Keiko in Life magazine. Mm. Life magazine, and, she, and Keiko was on the cover. And there was a, a, a gentleman was reading it, or his wife was reading it, and I believe, I don't know their names, but he, ha, he had just sold his company to AT&T, or something to AT&T, and had done really, really well. And she was in bed with him, and they're reading, you know, they're laying in bed, and they're reading before bed, and she nudges him or something and says, you should help this whale get freed. And he's like, what is it, dear? You know, what happened? And he does. He basically goes behind, they spend a bunch of money, they lo move her, to eventually to Iceland for That's two years. Amazing. So wow. it worked. And, and, and a wealthy individual who had the cash got mm -hmm. behind it and kind of helped push something through and made it made a change in the world. Wow. As you journey through this, if there comes a time, uh -huh. we will do anything in our power to help <laughs> yes. this mission. Yes. We, Maybe a listener will hear a part of this. Well, that's what I mean. Yeah. We got a lot of we have a lot of people on our we channel. Big like, community whatever on that YouTube means. Like, that listen right. and that watch. We'll scream from do. the mountaintops. Yeah. This is such a beautiful story. And there's a lot of activists out there fighting for. Her. I'm yes. just telling you. Yeah, I'm no, a documentarian. Almost everything I tell you is from a camera lens, saying. And that's I've observed something yeah. here, and I'm sharing it. And it's one thing. It, it's one thing to free. To free her is amazing. To give her that freedom. Yeah. But to capture it and tell the story. Yeah. Of that Can is so important yeah. to document that. Yeah. That's like, yes. that's to me, that's why cameras exist. Yeah. It's to capture that yeah. kind of, that right. kind of journey. So what you- Anything. Anything you can you do. Can do. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I don't know, that's more. fucking, Let's see oh what my happens. God. Yes. I melted Please it from let that. Us know. Oh my God. And you know, for everyone watching and listening as well, like where, what is the best place to find your work? Oh, uh, you can go to earthlings.com earthlings yeah. or nationearth.com is my production company, Nation Earth. Take you to the same place. Okay. Um, yeah, earthlings.com. And so we just, we post some videos there. We don't, I don't do a lot of social media personally, actually. I don't, I have my own personal stuff. I don't, I haven't posted in four years. <laughs> so I'm not really active on it. Um, mostly the efforts are spent toward uh, development and then mm -hmm. uh, the, a piece of the, the project itself, mm -hmm. whatever it is. So I tend mm -hmm. to take my focus. It's a nice opportunity to kind of sit with people who yes. do this more often. Yes, this is sure. amazing. And here we are at a beautiful sanctuary. Yeah. Yes. And we have our Halloween costumes. <laughs> yes. For the it party, is Halloween. you know, yeah. because we talk and we deal with lots of dark ideas and dark energy and just all of the ideas that we're going through here. They, there's so much joy and there's so much sadness. Yeah. But it's important, I think, to spend time. And for anyone listening that that fights the sort of compassion fatigue that can come along with a lot of thinking mm. and analyzing and self exploration around this, to spend time at sanctuaries is a yeah. beautiful way to connect with the to animals. Like, how many animals do you guys have here? I don't know what they have now. I haven't yeah. been here for over a month and they rescue all the time. They rescue as they have room and they right. have the means. So uh, I saw there's a pig there. And yeah. There's horses, horses, I saw some geese, some yeah, turkeys. They, have, they, have, they just have new enclosures that are up there. Oh, wow. uh, it's just up, you can't quite see it from here, but yeah, so they're, That's beautiful. they're growing. They're it's still so working, as you can see. I mean, the brick pallets are here, so they're... Uh, I think that's what I love about sanctuaries though, is like they always constant growth yes. like you plant Just the seed someone has a, room, a beautiful idea mm -hmm. and then over the over years and over time more animals come more people get involved yeah. and the facilities usually grow into these beautiful it, listen, beautiful vision into form like, yeah i love really. vision into vision form. into form you know it's it's uh something is intangible and then you're sitting on it you're touching it you're feeling it you know it's yeah beautiful. Like you said, to get an idea, and then you get so big at one point, you got to get a second location. It's great. It's incredible. Which is a good problem to that's have. It's a great problem. That's a yeah. good problem. <laughs> good people doing good things. Exactly. That's yeah. what let's, it's all let's about. Let's focus on that as well, like yeah. yourself and all the work that you're doing. Uh, it's amazing. Uh, Thank you. Thank you for doing what you do. Spoke on the wheel, just like you yeah. guys, just trying to. If anything, you know, you just say, if you do anything in this world, you just, I think, don't have a negative effect. Mm. Yes. Whatever you're doing, just have a positive effect. As a, you know, just last thing I think this world needs is, yeah, you're either you're either part of the solution or you're part of the problem. I, don't be part of the problem, you know. It's, yeah. Don't have a negative effect. Have a positive. There's effect. some real simplicity in that. Mm -hmm. Basic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not that hard. Yeah. Cool, man. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Sean. For thank you, everybody. This beautiful. I'm getting ready. Today. Here we go. Yes. Our, our Going to blast off. You'll find Xavian, who's, who's dressed as the king from uh, 
from where the wild things awesome. are today. <laughs> That's what that was. That yeah, yeah. yeah. It was yeah. too hot earlier to put the whole yeah, outfit yeah, yeah. on. But now, now, now this is, now this is a good temperature. All right, cool. Him. Amazing. How do you end? Do you just sort of end, or we're just, just sort of we're, do we we're, sort of peter out? We're fucking doing it right okay. now. We just <laughs> blasting off. Right, good. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>